Hello and welcome back to my channel, Quirky What If. Join us as we delve into the realms of fanfiction and fantasy, bringing you the best stories and discussions. Today, we're kicking off the first part of our series, What If Deku Was an Information Broker? If you enjoy this video, please give it a like and subscribe for more content in the future. The author of this story is Black Wolf Hunting from Fanfiction.net. All the relevant links are in the description. Feel free to say hello to the author on their profile. Now, let's dive into the fanfic. Looking for a successor. Analysis. He had been told about the agency by Gran Torino. The old man having been chiding him for not finding a successor for one for all and then trailed off into telling him about Analysis. An agency that was all about information upon information on heroes. On anyone with a quirk actually. And now he was standing in front of the building, looking up and wondering if he should have called and booked an appointment. He sighed as he ran a thin and bony looking hand through his long blonde locks. He had been looking for a successor for over four years now, starting at working at UA. High school, the premier school for all superhero wannabes. Four years of looking, for searching and researching and talking and watching. All for nothing. He hadn't been able to find a successor in the four years of working at the school, though he had come close. Lamillion, or Mirio Tagata, who had been the intern for Sir Nighteye and a third-year student when he had arrived. Always smiling, always pushing forward, and always willing to sacrifice himself for the greater good but still come out in mostly one's peace. He had actually asked him if the situation was possible, if he would take one of the greatest quirks of all time and be able to carry on being a pillar of peace. The firm and fast reply of no had come as a shocker and stunned him completely. I'm doing this because I want to prove I can do this. Mirio had explained with a wide smile, sitting on his bed after a run-in with some mafia guy. He had lost his quirk and Sir Nighteye had passed from that same mission. He thought this would be the perfect chance to try and get this kid to be his successor, only to have it blow up in his face. So Lemillion went on being quirkless and he had gone on looking for a successor. He hadn't found one on his own in all these years, not from searching the web or watching the new students come and go and get stronger and better. None of them spoke to him to be a successor. At all. It only got worse when the League of Villains came into the picture that first year he worked at UA. He wasn't happy about those first years getting involved but it proved redundant in the end to worry as they all held their own. He watched that same class continued confronting that league and win each and every time. He smirked to himself as he remembered that time Katsuki Bekugo had sent Tamira Shigaraki flying with an explosion. The villains were still at large though. He huffed as he shook his head and brought himself back to the present, looking up at the building that had a simple hanging sign outside proclaiming the name. Analysis. The building was three stories and looked like it had seen better days. Some of the windows had plastic over it where glass once was. Holes littered the building's walls that were also covered in plastic, and he was pretty sure he could see support beams poking out as well. This building had obviously been hit with different types of quirks in the past. He hoped the owner was okay. He sighed one more time before he walked over to the door, taking in the cracks in the window of the door and the peeling's paint, opening it and walking in. The tinkle of the bell over the door seemed rather ordinary for such a warm building but that seemed to calm him. Something small and ordinary like that was just a bomb to his shattered nerves. Too much hero shit and villains in this whole successor search. He needed the ordinary once in a while after all. The room was obvious a waiting lounge, though the furniture was just as wrecked as the outside seemed to be. Some of the furniture had been split in half and there was splinters and dust all over the place. He also noticed burn marks and stains of some sort of liquid. The only thing not touched was the reception desk where a girl of about nine sat behind it. Her long blonde hair held up in a ponytail and a little yellow horn poking out of her forehead. She wore a pink long-sleeved shirt and when she stood up on her chair to look at him, he saw a black skirt with black Mary Janes. Can I help you? She questioned with a smile on her face, staring up at him, though the chair made her taller it was almost impossible to match his seven-foot stature. Um dot 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 do I need an appointment? He questioned. I don't want to intrude unnecessarily. He explained at the tilt of her head. Well, that's nice of you. She said with a smile before jumping off the chair and walking around the desk. But not needed. You can go and see nice summer right now. He's got no one else coming in anytime soon. Oh dot 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 well dot 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 that's great. He mumbled as he followed the little girl upstairs that was behind a door. It was the second story, where most of the holes were invisible from the outside. I just don't dot 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 want to take up any important time from this place. It'll be fine. Naisama can always pause your meeting long enough to deal with idiots or just leave and have your meeting elsewhere. She skipped two steps and then three with an impossibility that shouldn't have surprised him but did. She was a tiny little thing. Naisama is right in here. She said with a smile as she opened the door that had the same name of the business, though in an elegant calligraphy. He nodded to the girl in thanks before entering the room, staring in astonishment at the complete disaster the room was. Everything looked like it was soaking wet with patches of scorch marks. There was also papers all over the place that were almost completely or partially burnt. The lights were flickering above him, as if they were having problems staying alive while the emergency fire sprinklers were still dripping from being used earlier. The desk was still there though completely burned black while he assumed the rest of the furniture had been burned to ash. Even the metal filing cabinets were burnt to piles of goo. Forgive the mess, I had a client earlier that threw a fit because I refused to give information out on a certain hero. A voice said, startling him from his inspection of the room. 
His sight turned to look at a person that entered through a door just behind the desk, staring at him with a crimson eye and an emerald one. He stared in curiosity of the figure, wondering how this young man could have so much information on quirks all over the world, though he could see how some of the women could complain about their seduction techniques not working on him. A white button-up shirt with the sleeves rolled up to his elbows with a black dress vest buttoned up, matching black slacks and then shiny black dress shoes on his feet. The first couple buttons of his shirt were undone showing off a hard hairless chest. Black gloves rest upon his hands and he couldn't figure out why. His green hair was cut short but showed curly hair had the right side gelled back revealing a massive burn that consumed half of his forehead that led down around the right crimson eye and then trailed down his right cheek to fade off into the hairline. Faint scarring was also along his neck, disappeared under his shirt, until it reappeared on his right arm and trailed beneath the black gloves. Both eyes glimmered though as they stared at him with amusement. Have you finished analyzing me yet? Oh, um yes, I have my boy. Forgive me, I wasn't expecting someone as young as you to be running this business. He admitted as he ran a hand through his hair nervously. The man shrugged as he walked over to another door, opening a closet where he pulled out a collapsible folding chair that had large cushions on the seat and settled it in front of the desk. He pulled out another one and settled that one behind the desk before waving at the chair for him to sit down. That's all right. Most don't. He admitted easily. Nineteen is rather young to be an information broker, but there have been younger doing more dangerous jobs. He raises a brow at him and earned a chuckle and a nod. Anyways, what does one such as yourself come here for? All Might. All Might sputters for a second, wiping a bit of blood from his lip as he gulped down the pool of it that wanted to fall from his mouth. What dot 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 what are you talking about? I'm not All Might. He's big and strong and I'm small and scrawny. He shouted as he waved his hands around to try and prove his point. The teen just raises his eyebrows at the hero before sitting down in his own seat while All Might just stands there looking uncomfortable and uneasy. Look, I'm an information broker. I've studied every person in the world with a quirk thanks to the Registration Act of 2067 that required quirks be registered. I can also put two and two together after seeing you walking about UA. In both forms. But I'm not All Might. He tried again. Right. In this form your name is Toshinori Yagi. A man that is missing most of his stomach and parts of his lung. But when you use one for all, you transform into All Might the Pillar of Peace. The kid had the audacity to smirk as he reached into his desk and pulled out a file of All Might's information. It was just standard information with nothing about his quirk or his malnourished form, but still, the amount of information there was terrifying. Now then, would you like help looking for a successor or continue playing an idiot? Tashinori frowned for a long moment before sighing and collapsing into his chair. How did you know? Like I said, I'm an information broker. My knowledge is my money. He put away his folder on All Might before looking at the hero with a serious eye. I know what you want but unfortunately, the one you want. The slamming of a door below caught both of their attention. Tashinori flinched at the thought of being seen like this while the other sighed in frustration. Did you have an appointment? The hero questioned as curses rose to them while screeching of the female variety appeared next. No, I gave up on appointments when they just barge in anyways. The kid sighed as he waved his hand towards the door behind him. Go in here and stay on the stairs. I'll be there in a second to bring you back out. He stated as he rose from his chair and opened the door. It's better if you aren't in here when this one comes up. The stomping and cursing worried the hero but he figured that this man could handle them, even if the building took more damage than before. So he quickly hid behind the door and listened to what seemed to be a soon entertaining or interesting conversation. Deku, a somewhat gruff and familiar voice shouted. He knew it because he had taught that same young man back in UA not too long ago. I want my fucking information you shitting broker. What information would that be Kakin? This young man had balls of steel to talk to Ground Zero like that. That kid had always had a temper, though it had gotten better over the years. He still had triggers that could send him in a rage. You fucking know what information I'm looking for. Give it to me, you shitty useless quirkless Deku. Oh shit. Tashinori stood up to intervene when he heard that, gaping as he realized that he had just left someone defenseless against someone powerful. I already told you Kakin, I don't hand out information on heroes to other heroes or villains. If you're looking for a villain profile, I will have it for you for a price. You will not get a profile on another hero as you are supposed to work with each other and not against. He could hear the steel in that voice and then shuffle. He wondered if the kid had settled in his chair or maybe had moved to be ready to dodge. The sounds of something akin to firecrackers went off and had Tashinori ready to transform. Do you really want a repeat of what happened last time you fucking wimp? If you mean that I send you out of here soaking like a fucking tissue after a masturbation session, then you're in luck. Endeavor was here already and I've already used up my water usage for today. The hell was this kid doing giving that kind of information away? That was a weakness he couldn't afford. Silence for what seemed forever before a cackle filled the area. Fucking wimp. Giving free fucking information to me all the goddamn time. Footsteps and it was obvious Ground Zero was heading straight at the kid. I'll take that information now. More silence before the sound of a drawer opening and rummaging came to him. Do you really think I only have one plan to stop you? How you underestimate me is really disgusting. Tashinori couldn't explain what happened next, only that there was a swish and then hacking coughs. The fuck. What dot 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 war dot 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 what the fuck dot 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 is this dot 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 this shit? 
Katsuki shouted as he continued to curse and yell. Industrial baby powder. It's made to keep babies from getting rashes but it also absorbs liquids as well, including sweat. You won't be able to cause any more explosions unless you go home and take a shower. Then it was just Katsuki Bakugo left hacking and coughing for a long moment before the kid spoke up again. Now listen to me Kaken, and listen well. The sound of more rummaging and then a folder hitting the table. I will not give information on heroes out to anyone. That includes your information as well and yes, I have more information on you than you would be comfortable knowing. I fucking don't doubt that shit. Another cough. We've known each other since our shitty childhood. Yes, so you could imagine the information I could hand out easily if I wanted to. But I won't, because you're a hero and not a villain. So understand the fact that I will not give you information on All Might no matter what you do. Silence once more and Tashinori could just imagine the staring contest. TCH, fine. Keep your stupid crappy information then. Footsteps and the sound of the other door opening. Oh and Kakin dot 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 don't break into my office ever again. You won't find any information on any hero but General. The rest of it I keep it all up here. Silence and then the sound of the door slamming and curses fading away into the distance. You can come back out now. Tashinori opened the door and looked inside, chuckling at the cloud of baby powder that was still settling over the room. Sorry about that, but he's been nothing but a pain the last month or so. Tashinori shrugged as he retook his seat, watching as the kid walked around and instead leaned against his desk. He looked like he was agitated now, glancing at the door and the windows as if waiting for an attack. It's quite alright my boy. Bakugo has always been rather explosive, even more so when he was a child. The kid looked at him with wide eyes before understanding came to him with a chuckle. That's right, you worked at UA. When Kakin was there, he nodded to himself before shaking his head. Right, UA. Successor, passing on one for all. He muttered to himself as he cupped his chin between thumb and pointer finger. Ah, before that, could I possibly get a name and maybe an explanation on how you know young Bakugo? Tashinori questioned with a tilted head, his curiosity getting the better of him at the moment. He hadn't known Bakugo ever acting like that around anyone, almost as if he had known them personally and so knew what to say to them. This kid also called the other with a nickname that spoke of familiarity so maybe friends from when they were younger. I know Kakin because he's the one who gave me this scar. The kid stated as he waved his hand over the right side of his face where it was covered in the scar. You should know that since you were there to save both of us from that slime monster. And that's when he remembers. Tashinori had been running all over the town looking for a thief made out of slime and gunk. He had chased it all around the sewers before it had finally gone up and attacked two students. One of them had an explosive quirk that had gotten the villain off of the other student, but had injured him gravely in doing so. All Might had been able to step in before the villain had turned on the other kid. He had heard the one injured had been permanently scarred while the other had been praised for his heroics in trying to help his friend. No repercussions were given. That was you that day. He muttered to himself as he ran a hand over his face. I had heard about you being injured and had offered money to help pay for surgeries and recovery treatments, but it had been refused. Yes, my mother didn't blame you. Instead she had tried to go through the office for regulations of quirks for a reimbursement since it was an individual's fault in using that quirk without authorization. He explained with a tilt of his head. But they refused because Kakin was underage and had been accepted into UA. High school. They didn't want to have him kicked out because of a record. I see. I'm sorry that happened to you my boy. Silence hung between the two of them for a long moment before All Might looked up at him. I still have not received a name though. Uh, Midori Izuku, information broker, and quirkless. The teen explained with a small smile that it all might smiling back. It was a soft look and made his chest warm at the sight of it. He hadn't seen one like that since Nana. Now then, I believe we were talking about a successor for you. Excuse me. A voice interrupted, causing Izuku to sigh and look up at the door, Tashinori also looking up as well. I'm sorry to interrupt but I came to pick up a file. Todoroki Shoto. Yes I have your information right here. Izuku pulled out a file from the drawer. Know that I am only giving you this information because you aren't using it against heroes and do not tell anyone else I gave it to you. I don't need a stampede of overgrown toddlers waddling in here for something I will not give them for reasons they want it. Ah, uh, I know, Shoto said as he glanced at the blonde figure sitting in the chair. I must thank you again for trusting me with this. I've been desperate to get out from under my father's business but haven't been able to find a way. You are sure these heroes will help me? Ah, uh, that's why the half-white and half-red-haired boy was here. He knew that his father had been plaguing him to hurry up and join his company, but he also knew of the abuse the boy went through at his father's hand. He wondered if giving the boy an olive branch at his own office would help. Yes, I suggest looking at All Might's first. He's been looking for someone competent to run the building for a while now since he's going to be retiring soon. I'm sure you'll fit the criteria for it easily. The look on the broker's face gave mischief as he settled back into his chair, threw his feet up on his desk, and laced his fingers together under his chin. Also, I would like to ask you to take pictures of your father next you see him. I'm sure you'll understand why soon enough. Todoroki just shrugged his shoulders with a smirk of his own before reaching into his pocket and pulling out a large envelope. Here is your payment. I hope this will help in repairs that was obviously caused by my father. No worries there. Izuku quickly opened the envelope and pulled out a large stack of money, running a gloved finger along the end to cause the money to flip. 
I've already filled out a harassment suit against him and sent in a claim to my insurance with a video of Endeavor attacking me. Again, I'll receive enough reimbursement from the insurance company and Endeavor's own office to keep me from suing to fix this place up nicely. Both heroes chuckled at that before the icy hot hero turned and walked out of the office without another word. I see you are capable of helping others where needed to. Toshinori admired that fact greatly in the teen. Very few people could bend their rules to help those truly in need, so seeing that this kid could warm him even more. That and I hate when Endeavor comes in here demanding. I can only imagine what that kid went through living with that thing. The sneer on the other's face was startling but understandable, thinking just because he has a quirk that he has all the power in the world. And then let's not forget the fact that he thinks there's only worth in things if there's power behind it. God, it's so annoying and frustrating. He shook his head as he sat up and put the money in a drawer of the desk. I can understand that. Tosh Nori agreed just as the girl entered with a plate with coffee and biscuits. Ah, thank you very much. No problem. I figured Naisama would need it after having so many interruptions while talking to you, sir. She explained as she settled the plate on the desk and handed a cup to the hero. I hope you don't mind too much. I know it can be annoying but we can't really stop anyone from coming in as they please. The only place that can take the hits and has all the equipment needed to fight back are in this room. Toshinori blinked at the information, glancing around and wondering where all the equipment actually was before turning back to an amused-looking Izuku. You won't find it by looking. I've only given access to Miyanuri, so only we know where it is. Not even Mei would be able to find it if she tried. He chuckled as he picked up his cup and sipped at the liquid inside, groaning in please. God, you are one hell of a gift, Iri. You make the best coffee ever. Iri giggled at the compliment. Thank you, Naisama. I try my best for you. I know you do. Izuku replied softly before shaking his head. Now then, a successor. The door slammed open down below. Jesus fucking Christ. Will I get a break today? The teen groaned as his head slammed into the table as the door to the office opened and a very familiar and unwelcomed figure walked into the room. I want all you have on all might. Now, Endeavor growled as he walked in, flames fanning around him wildly as he glared at the teen behind the desk. Though his normally tanned skin was a bright purple at the moment and clashed horrendously with his flames. I know you gave Shoto information on him not even two minutes ago. I want it now. I gave him general information on the location of All Might's office, nothing more. Izuku replied harshly as he stood up from the desk and quickly walked around so that he was in between the number two hero and the two near his desk. I will not change my mind, especially not since you torched my office earlier this morning. He growled right back. Damn, this kid definitely has some balls on him. Toshinori thought as he watched the confrontation, wondering how he was going to handle the other this time around. Though from what I've seen so far, though little as it is, he seems to have a plan for every attack that comes his way. I wouldn't have done that if you had just given me that information I requested. The flames around him flared him wildly as his temper flared. Obviously this was a regular occurring argument between the two. And if I had the choice, I wouldn't have been left in a burning building with my mom while you walked right past us. Izuku shot right back as he crossed his arms. I'm sure the media would love to hear how the number two hero left a child and his mother to burn to death. Silence hung in the office for a long moment before Toshinori stood up from his seat, a glare on his face as he looked at the other hero. You did what? Endeavor looked at the blonde for a long moment, realizing just now that it was not just the brat and the girl in the office now. It is none of your concern, citizen. Back down. I wouldn't worry about this trash Toshinori-san. He'll be leaving now before I call the cops. Regulation and control of quirks and his office about the continuing harassment. Izuku informed as his cell phone appeared in his hands. Endeavor looked at the kid for a long moment before huffing and turning, leaving the office where Toshinori was left glaring after his fellow hero. I'm sick of this. Iri, go grab your jacket and we'll go to that coffee shop you like so much. Come Toshinori-san, I'll treat you and we'll finish our conversation there. Izuku said as he pulled out his own black jacket from the closet with the chairs, putting it on as Iri did her own light pink one. Toshinori could only stare in amazement as this kid walked out the door, analyzing potential. Why are you chasing me? He screamed as he ran down the path that had been his main route home for as long as he could remember. He'd have to go under the pass and through the tunnel, but he'd get home this way. At least he hoped he would. Fucking D.K.U. Get back here and let me blow your fucking shit up. One Katsuki Bakugo shouted as he chased after the other boy, many explosions erupting from his hands as his blonde hair waved in the wind. His explosive quirk terrified everyone at their school and caused Izuku more than a few burns. Why would I stop when you say that? He shouts back as he entered into the tunnel that would be the halfway point home only to come to a complete stop as a whole new horror ripped through his body. Oh, what's this? A new invisibility cloak. The voice was gurgle-like, as if constantly changing. But that was the least of Izuku's worries when the green slime slammed into him and proceeded to force itself into his mouth and down his throat. Don't worry, this'll only hurt for a minute and then it'll all be over. No, Izuku screamed in his head as he clawed at the green slime, trying to get it off and away from his mouth. He couldn't breathe and he couldn't scream and he couldn't do anything but struggle weakly. He had no quirk to fight back with. He was quirkless and unable to fully fight against the slime. He was being suffocated to death because of that and also because this slime wanted to use him. He was going to die here. 
There'd be no help. He would die. The fuck you think you're doing to Deku, you fucking sewer scum? Kakin. That was Kakin. He'd help. He was strong. He would save Izuku even though he hated the boy. He wanted to be a hero after all. What Izuku wasn't expecting was for the explosion that Kakin let loose to blow not only the slime creature off of him, but to decimate the right side of his face. Excruciating pain consumed him as the fire and ate at his face and his shoulder and arm and chest. The blast had been huge, much bigger than he could remember Kakin ever making before. Now it was tearing into him and he screamed in pain even as the slime still somewhat lodged in his throat. He doesn't remember a whole lot after that except pain. Pain, 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 pain. It all hurt and he wanted it to stop. But it wasn't and so he screamed, cried, sobbed, and writhed in pain. He did remember two strong hands cradling his body against a warm one even as sirens blared somewhere in the distance. A strong voice whispering to him even as cursing in the background caused him to cringe. The warmth of the arms and the chest he was held against helped a little but the burning sensation tore into more and more, especially around his right eye and inwards. It was excruciating to the point of him wondering how he was awake. It'll be okay. Help is coming. Just stay awake and not sleep. Words filtered in and out, all saying the same thing. God how he wanted to just curl into that gentle and reassuring voice. He had no clue which hero, for it could be no one else as Kakin would have been insulting him, had arrived to help them. He hoped it was one he knew, like Kamui Woods, Blood King, or Best All Might. Just keep awake. You'll be okay. Fucking Deku got in my way. He whimpered at that voice. He knew Kakin was angry and that he'd take it out on him the moment he could. He didn't want to face the other team though. God he'd been burned by the explosions before but not like this. It hurt beyond belief. He cried, sobbed, whimpered, and clung to the warmth holding him all the way to the hospital. All until they had put him under so that they could try and save him in his face. God, he hoped it wouldn't hurt as much when he woke. Analysis. They arrived at a coffee shop that was painted a bright blue with homey fixtures. The tables were small and round with some booths that held white cushions and bright yellow flowers painted on them. Then there was just an air of home and warmth that he enjoyed a great deal even as he had to wipe blood from his lips. Order anything you like. It'll be my treat. Izuku said as he sat down at the round table directly in front of the window that looked out onto the street. Very two cake limit. You still have to eat dinner later. He ordered the girl as she looked over the menu. The girl pouted before nodding her head as she returned to the menu. Tashinori sat down as well and already know he was going to order a plain black coffee. Thank you very much young man, I appreciate this. The young man waved his hands as if it was of little matter, his eyes on the menu as well. Order something to eat as well Tashinori-san, you need to have some fuel for later. Oh no, I'm fine. I'm not hungry at all. He assured quickly. He was actually a little but it wouldn't be worth it since he couldn't really eat a whole lot in one sitting. Do not think to fool me. You need to start eating small meals multiple times a day to stay healthy. That's why you have become this malnourished in the first place, trying to eat large meals like a normal person when you should be eating several small meals a day. Izuku lectured as he continued to gaze over the menu. He was not about to let this man wither away just because he's too stupid to change his lifestyle to accommodate his health. Heroes could really be idiots sometimes. Tashinori sat there stunned once more at this young man. He would not think he knew much due to his age but he did. He knew so much and could put it to use in so many different ways. Either way, I'll order you something small and you will eat it. And then you will go and talk to Recovery Girl and see about a new eating schedule and plan after we finish our meeting. Izuku continued as he nodded to himself and settled the menu down before standing. Do you know what you want to eat, Eri? Yes, Naisama. A slice of the cherry supreme cheesecake and a slice of the triple-decker white chocolate cake. With a white elephant, she ordered with a smile on her face. Got it. I'll be right back then. He said as he took off for the counter where a pretty blonde stood behind it waiting to take his order. Naisama will order you something really good. I promise. She gushed as she got his attention. He knows exactly what people can and can't eat even if they don't. So you'll be fine. I see. That's good to know. He nodded to her before looking at her a little more closely, taking in the scars that covered her arms after she had removed her jacket. There were also some on her neck and face but it faded so they weren't as obvious. Whoever this girl was, she had been through a lot in her young life. He just hoped it wasn't because of this young man. So, how do you know Midoriya? You don't look like you're related to him. She tilted her head at him before smiling brightly. I'm not. Naisama actually rescued me three years ago from my old home. He hasn't allowed me to be taken away from him ever since. She explained as her eyes wandered over to the young man, watching him pay for the orders. He's been so nice to me and he's invited Mirio over too. I don't think I'd be here if either hadn't tried to save me so viciously. The hero frowned at the information, knowing exactly who Mirio was. The young man had lost his quirk and refused one for all without a second thought. I see. So you were there when Overhaul was arrested. He murmured to himself, chin resting between his thumb and finger in thought. I knew they had said a girl had disappeared from the scene but no one could find her. That was Iri, Izuku said as he reappeared. He sat a big pink mug with whipped cream and a cherry on top in front of the girl before settling two pieces of sweets in front of her. Obviously it was the cheesecake covered in cherries and sauce while the white chocolate cake was swamped in frosting. 
Toshinori received a yellow mug with what seemed to be green tea and a plate of small sandwiches that looked to be made up of tomatoes and cheese. Izuku sat down after he settled a green mug with steaming coffee in it and a lemon pound cake. You got me tea, the hero stated as he looked down at the liquid with disdain. He normally didn't mind tea but he really wanted coffee at the moment. Not to mention the sandwiches were rather dainty looking, like for a woman. Your stomach can't handle the caffeine in coffee. That's one of the reasons why you cough up so much blood. You're overtaxing your stomach. He explained calmly as he sipped at his own coffee calmly. So drink the tea. It has honey in it as well to help keep it calm and help heal any damage you might have done to it. Then the sandwiches don't have anything heavy but will give you the nutrition you need. Toshinori grunted but sipped at the tea anyways. It was definitely the normal green tea with honey in it, so it wasn't bad. Then he took a bite from one of the sandwiches, enjoying the freshness of the tomatoes and lettuce. The cheese was sharp and gave a bite where the veggies didn't. Not bad, he muttered as he took another small bite. Good, now that we are out of my office and hopefully away from any more interruptions. Izuku said as he pulled out a folder from his jacket and settled it on the table. I've been looking for a suitable successor for you for some time now. Unfortunately, I came up with only one. He explained, taking a bite of his own cake while he tore into her own. Unfortunately, how is that bad? It sounds like you might have found someone I could use. He tilted his head to the side and thought. There weren't many that could handle his power and he had always been picky about it. He wanted to be able to connect to his successor and not just be like, here, have this quirk and use it wisely. It could end disastrously. It didn't matter what Gran Torino or Recovery Girl or anyone else thought. He needed to make sure there was that connection with his successor so that it would all work out for everyone. Because, the only person I can find that fits the requirements for one for all dot 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 has already refused it. He flipped open the file to reveal Lemillion's picture. And at that moment, Toshinori despaired at ever finding a successor. Someone to take his power and use it to help other people like he had been doing for years now. What was he going to do? There's no one else. He questioned. Izuku's grim face told him all he needed to know. Though it didn't stop the young man from reaching over and laying a hand on the blonde's forearm as his hand still held a sandwich. I know this is disappointing, but people like Mirio are only born every decade or century. You've been All Might for over half a century and no one else has appeared yet. It could be a few more or it could be another century. Izuku smiled at him then, that soft and warm smile that sent warmth into Tashinori's chest and calmed him. But don't give up hope yet. I'll keep an eye on all the new registrations and those appearing in schools all over the world. When I find someone that fits your requirements, I'll let you know immediately. That was a relief that Toshinori couldn't even explain. Though it helped that this young man was willing to help him out no matter what. It was refreshing and made his heart calm and stop beating harshly against his chest. Thank you. I can't even imagine a way I could ever pay you back. How much will this cost? He questioned as he quickly pulled out his checkbook to pay at least a little for all this young man had done so far. Nothing. That caused a pause and the hero could only stare in astonishment at the young man. Izuku sipped at his coffee before looking at the man with a smile. I remember that day you know, when I was attacked by the slime guy in that tunnel with Kakin. He explained. Tashinori remembered too. He had been too late to safely save the young man. His friend had decimated his face and body trying to save him with his explosions. The burns had been bad and the boy had lost his eye. He still regretted not being there for him. I am sorry for arriving too late. No, you showed up just in time. I was gonna die if you hadn't showed up either way. Even if Kekin hadn't been there, I would have died. Izuku mumbled slightly as he rubbed the back of his head. So you saved me that day and so anything you could ever need is on the house. I'll never turn your way and I'll do all I can to help you. He explained with that smile again. Tashinori could only stare in amazement once more. This kid who had suffered at his friend's hands and because he had been too late to save him dot 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 di didn't blame him. If anything this kid admired him, which sent more warmth through him. I can't always have you do things for free though. He stated sternly as he looked just as stern. At least allow me to help fix your office with more. Durable furniture and windows. You don't need to be replacing things all the time. Izuku stared at the smirk that now laid on his all-time favorite hero's face before returning that smirk. You have to make sure that it'll endure Endeavor's flames and Kakin's explosions. Otherwise it'll be pointless to replace things with anything super expensive. It'll just be destroyed the next day. I know a guy. Toshinori sipped at his tea with a hum as he realized his stomach wasn't constricting as painfully as it normally did. Maybe changing his diet did have some benefit to it after all. All right then, I'll have to recheck some things at the office, but as soon as I find someone, I'll let you know and you can go and meet them. Izuku sighed as he pulled out his phone to check the time and see any messages he might have gotten. An explosion blasted the window they were sitting in inwards, sending all three flying away with such force that it stunned them. Izuku gasped as he quickly sat up from the floor, looking for the familiar pale Haraviri, only sighing in relief when he saw her kneeling next to a coughing Toshinori. Blood pooled beneath the hero but Izuku knew he would be fine for the moment and quickly turned towards the window where he could see a confrontation happening outside. Ground Zero stood in the middle of the street facing a familiar slimy figure. Fuck. Izuku groaned as he quickly crawled over to the two and proceeded to drag them behind the counter. Luckily they had been the only ones in the cafe at the time and so were able to move quickly. Stay here. 
He ordered her with a stern glare before looking at the old male and taking in the pool of blood coming out of him. He grimaced already knowing he needed to get the other to recover a girl but would be unable to at the moment. He glanced over at the workers in the back of the cafe, making sure they were all okay before turning and looking over the counter to the fight outside. Kakin was strong, he knew that, but he wasn't always coherent in battle as his rage and adrenaline took over. He was as much a danger as the villain, though he would pay attention to civilians as much as he could. Still dangerous though. That fucker came back. He hissed to himself as he watched Kakin send a blast at the villain, though the other just reformed and sent a giant fist at the hero, who dodged out of the way. A crater was left behind as the villain continued his attack. I'm not sure he can keep himself steady and calm enough to beat him. He completely lost it the last time we faced him and that's when I lost my eye and was burned completely. He mumbled under his breath, trying to figure out what to do. That villain dot 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 you're talking about dot 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 the slime one. Tashinori questioned in between coughs and sputters of blood. The one that I saved you from. Years ago. Yeah, that's the one. He nodded as he crouched back down to take in the hero trying to stand up. Don't. You don't have the strength right now, not to mention there's others watching you. He flicked a look at the workers of the cafe that had them in full sight. Ground Zero will handle this, don't worry. A scream caught Izuku's attention and he shot up to look over the counter. In time to see a teenage girl around the age of 14, cowering as the slime monster swarmed towards her just outside of the cafe. Kakin was too far away and if he tried an explosion, he would just hurt the girl. Izuku didn't even remember his body moving. All he knew was that he was soon consumed by slime that was swarming into his mouth and down his throat. He couldn't breathe. He couldn't scream. It was all too familiar as he clawed at the slime, trying desperately to get it out of his mouth and out of his body. He wanted nothing of this thing in him or on him or near him. He didn't want it. Fuck, he was losing air. His vision was going gray and he knew it would go black soon. With no air getting into his lungs to go to his brain, his body was shutting down. He wouldn't last more than a minute or so at this rate. Burning pain on his left side. Kakin must have tried exploding the thing again. He could feel the pain there. That bastard never learned. Explosions couldn't save everyone when used but it could always hurt someone. God how he hated Kakin sometimes. Do not fear. Wait dot 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 that couldn't be. That idiot was hurt. He was just going to make it worse. For I am here. A great gush of air and soon Izuku was laying on the ground, gasping for air and sucking it in as much as he could. His limbs shook from the adrenaline running through him and the fear of dying. He hadn't been that close to death in a while, but boy did he not miss it at all. Deku, fucking useless piece of shit. Tell me you're alive. Kakin was standing over him now, glaring down at his face even as worry flickered through his eyes. I knew you. Cared. He got out with a weak smile, gasping as the other growled and hauled him up on his feet before grabbing his left arm and looking at it. Fuck. I got you, damn it. Piece of shit, what were you thinking you a smunching bug? He questioned as he stared at his childhood friend. His crimson eyes glared fiercely through his black domino mask that was ragged along the edges. Don't dot 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 no dot 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 my body just moved. He said as he rubbed at his throat tiredly before looking around. All Might showed up. Yeah, he's getting that fucking sewer scum gathered in another plastic bottle. Fuck it all. Make sure you get that healed you useless trash. Kakin growled at him just as he reappeared at the quirkless man's side with a glare of her own. He wouldn't be hurt if you hadn't have tried to blow him up. She stuck her tongue at the blonde as she grabbed a hold of Izuku's hand in both of hers. You're so mean and reckless. How are you a hero? Kiri, not now. Izuku sighed as he pulled the girl into his side and gave her a quick hug, though she refused to let go a moment later. Thanks for the save either way. I'm... He paused as he cringed at the memory. It was just as horrible as the first time if not worse. He wasn't sure he was going to get any sleep that night. Actually, he wasn't even going to try to sleep that night. Fucking stay out of the way and you wouldn't need rescuing. The hero huffed before he turned and stomped away to where police officers were now showing up and taking statements. Izuku knew that he would have to stick around and make sure he and Iri gave their statements as well. They wouldn't be leaving anytime soon. That was rather brave of you. A voice said from behind the two, startling them. Izuku whipped around with Iri pushed behind him, but calmed when he saw Tashinori in his malnourished form. Gave the police the slime guy already. He questioned, grimacing at the pain in his throat and how hoarse he suddenly sounded. Guess his injuries were starting to make themselves known. Yes, then I left before they could say anything else. I can't hold my hero form for very long anymore and have to save it as much as possible for emergencies. He explained as he leaned against the cafe building they still stood in front of. There was blood leaking out the side of his mouth that he wiped off but otherwise he looked unharmed. Your body moved on its own. Izuku frowned in confusion but nodded in agreement. Yeah. He coughed as his throat flared in pain, wondering why it hurt as much as it did. Though to be fair, it wasn't as bad as before the first time he had that run in. You saved this girl at the risk of your health and took her in. You gave her a home and kept her safe despite the fact she could bring danger to you. Tashinori continued on with a smile forming on his face as he took in the continuing confusion of both Izuku and Iri. The girl still had her arms wrapped around the older boy's waist, but her face was no longer buried in his side but her eyes now settled on him. Those golden eyes were slightly unsettling but otherwise he enjoyed the confusion. What dot 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 what about it? Izuku could already tell there was something going on in this man's head. 
He wasn't sure what it was but it had him on edge in a way he hadn't felt in a long time. Not since before high school and before the incident with the slime creep the first time around. This man had a plan and he was going to be damned if it wasn't going to happen. That was the feeling he was getting from Toshinori at the moment. Let's return to your building before I say anything more. I'm sure this is a conversation that will need privacy. He explains with that continuing growing grin. Izuku wasn't scared or worried from the grin, no, it was an anticipation that he had never felt in his life. He couldn't wait to return to his building to find out what All Might wanted to talk about now. Too bad they weren't returning to his building. He moved with intent in his eyes. Analysis. This kid dot 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 this kid was exactly what he was looking for. He had the balls to stand up for what he believed for, even if he was at a disadvantage. He was kind and patient with those around him, no matter how rude they may be. And then he had the instinct to protect no matter that cast to himself. Though he'll say that the kid did have a sense of preservation when acting against heroes that came into his office. The ability to predict and use their weaknesses against them was valuable and would continue to be so when going up against villains. Yes, the boy would do nicely. He thought just before everything turned black. All right, Uri, let's get him to UA. And looked at before anything in him goes worse. Izuku said as he maneuvered the much taller man's body onto his back so that he was carrying him piggyback style. The last thing they needed was for this guy to keel over on them while trying to find him a successor. Okay. The little girl agreed as she bounced forward with excitement. She had seen the school before, who hadn't with how close they lived to the school. You think they'll let us in? The security systems was just as legendary as the heroes that worked at the school after all. If Toshinori sent as his ID on him, then we should be able to slip in without too much of a problem. He said next as he dodged around people that were heading towards the scene of where the attack had been. The news that All Might had shown up must have been spread faster than normal but that didn't matter since the other man was completely asleep at this point. Stay close Eri, I don't want to lose you. The girl stuck close and kept a hand on his jacket as they trailed away from the scene and moved ever closer to the school. It took a little bit but they were able to get to the school easily enough, but now the real test came when they had to cross the gate and onto the school grounds. Stay close, I don't want you getting caught by the doors if something goes wrong. Izuku said as he glanced down at the girl before looking forward. Let's hope he brought his ID with him today. With it they stepped across the imaginary line of the outside world in the school. He paused for just a second, just in case he needed to jump back, but sighed when he realized nothing was going to happen and so moved forward. All right, keep close, I don't know what heroes are here or if they'll see us as threats. Here he held tight to his jacket as they moved into the building and then through the halls. Izuku was incredibly happy that they hadn't run into any heroes that would attack first and ask questions never. He knew how horribly impatient some heroes were and wasn't looking forward to dealing with any more that day. Endeavor and Kekin were more than enough. Then he had to be thankful that it was just after lunch so all the students should be in their classes. This would make it easier to get the stubborn idiot where he needed to be without any students asking pesky questions and the chance of losing Uri decreased as well. All of which disappeared when a feeling of utter and complete darkness descended upon his shoulders and almost knocked him to his knees. Uri had come to a complete stop and was sat on her butt due to the pressure exerting on her little body. It only got worse when Izuku felt a dribble of liquid cover his shoulder where Tashinori-san's chin was resting. He knew the other man felt the pressure and most likely was leaking blood again. There was nothing to be done about it though at the moment as he finally gave in and allowed his body to sink to one knee. He gasped for air and clenched his eyes shut, trying to keep his body from keeling over. Damn it, there's only one person who could exert this type of killing intent. He thought and forced an eye open to stare straight at the person that was causing him to struggle to stay standing. He wasn't sure how much longer he'd be able to last either. Now then, can you explain to me why a stranger, unauthorized and with a child, is on the premises of my school with one of my teachers on his back? The principal of UA. High school questioned calmly, hands behind his back with his tail stuck high into the air. It was obvious he was on both the defensive and offensive. But it wasn't just the principal Izuku had to worry about now, no, it was much worse. Pro Heroes Midnight, Eraser Head, Present Mike, Blood King, Snipe, and Ectoplasm were surrounding him in his charges. There was no way for Izuku to run away even if he wanted to and then add on to the fact that if they thought him a danger, he would be down and out before he could blink. He gulped and went to speak, but stopped when a familiar and unwelcome feeling snapped awake next to him. His head whipped to look at it curled up eerie, the child sobbing as the little horn on her forehead grew out into a spiral. Uri. He gasped out in horror before his eyes snapped to the one hero who could stop the oncoming disaster. Quirk. He gasped out at the yellow goggle-wearing hero. Use your quirk. He coughed as the pain in his throat reared its head again. God how he wished he hadn't had to swallow that stupid slime again. Stop her now. The racer had either got what he wanted or he was going to stop the use of the quirk anyways as his hair raised in the air and Uri's energy disappeared as she collapsed in exhaustion. Now, there'll be no such foolishness. The racer had said with a sigh as he kept his quirk activated a little bit longer before releasing it. Just come along quietly. Izuku scowled at them before looking directly at Nezu, the strange little principal that held the high-spec quirk. He dot 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 call off dot 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 your guard dot 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 dogs. He coughed afterwards. He was sure his throat was starting to swell and close with the trouble he had breathing now. The pressure wasn't letting up either. He wouldn't last much longer. Tell me why you're here first and I might. 
Nezu said politely but did not move an inch. Izuku coughed as his vision blackened and his body gave up. Too much happened too close together, it just couldn't handle it. Just as his body slumped forward and the weight on his back pressed into him fully as he fell to the floor, he could see the heroes move forward. Damn it all. He thought as he felt his face connect with the floor and All Might's weight disappeared from his back. I just wanted to get him to recovery girl. With that he fell into darkness, committing to the power, to think you put that much pressure on kids. Aizawa muttered as he looked down at the face of the little girl. She was young, maybe seven, at the most eight. He looked over to Midnight who was dragging the young man behind her by holding onto an ankle and letting everything else drag. Snipe had Tashinori on his back, still passed out and blood dribbling from his mouth. You might have done more damage to the blonde idiot too. Well, they were in a place they needn't be with a colleague of ours incapacitated. Nezu stated with a sadistic look in his eyes. I'd rather be cautious than allow a danger to enter our school willy-nilly. But still, Aizawa sighed as he shifted the girl more comfortably in his arms. To think to use that much pressure on a child that hadn't fought back. Against a young man that had all but begged him to use his quirk to stop the girl. The care the young man had taken to make sure the cargo he had on his back didn't hit the floor. He had caught the slight change in grip as the teen fell forward, to keep the older man from falling sideways and hitting the floor. We'll take them to recovery girl to be checked over, looks like Tashinori san could use it anyways. Keep the young man restrained, and then find out why he's here. Midnight shrugged her shoulders, ignoring how the man's head hit the corner as they turned it. No big deal, right? Only it is. Snipe cut in. He got onto the school grounds with only Tashinori san's ID. That's a huge weakness in our security system. That was a good point, Aizawa had to admit. They had several security breaks in the past, mostly back when he had that troublesome class a few years back. That had come to a stop though after they had graduated on to becoming pros, many of them already making their names in their area of expertise. Though Ground Zero, Katsuki Bakugo, was still on the edge for many people. Otherwise his best class had graduated last year and he couldn't be prouder of them. We'll fix that, no worries. Nezu said with ease as he continued to walk down the halls, obviously heading towards Recovery Girl. To dot 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 be dot 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 fair dot 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 only I know that. The voice was rough and low, obviously in pain. A grunt a moment later spoke of another wall hit. Could you dot 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 stop that please? He was pretty sure that kid probably had a concussion at this point. Hem, no, I don't think I will. Midnight said as she swung her hips that made the kid's body slam against the wall. So mean, was the grunt that came out but the kid didn't try and struggle, though he shifted his body so that he wasn't hitting the corners and walls as hard as before. She was Ji Chan. I have some new patience for you. Nezu exclaimed happily as he waltzed into the infirmary. Really, principal, you shouldn't have done such a thing. Recovery girl sighed as she swirled around in her chair, staring for a long moment at the three heroes carrying dot 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 or dragging their charges into the room and led by the principal. She sighed as she waved to the two open beds. Put Tashinori San on the first bed, the girl on the second bed, and let the boy sit on the chair there. She ordered, ignoring how the boy was tied up in Midnight's whip. Since we're here now and those two are getting taken care of, let's get you talking boy. Midnight said with a smirk as she settled the boy into the chair. Izuku looked at her with an unimpressed look. What? I've only ever got that look from Aizawa. She complained as she turned away. Izuku rolled his eyes at that before turning to the principal. You know dot 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 you could dot 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 have just dot 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 ask dot 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 me to follow dot 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 you to dot 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 rico dot dot very girl. He managed out, coughing here and there. Um, well, I didn't want to take chances. You are unauthorized to be on the school grounds and you had a teacher on your back. We have to be overly cautious instead of disastrously relaxed. Nezu explained with that ever-present smile and polite manner. I'll remember to put, sadistic and paranoid to your, file back at the office. Izuku informed deadpan before smirking. Oh wait, I already, have that. With that the whip snapped and he relaxed back in the chair, a thin blade in hand. He coughed and rubbed at his throat. Ask your, questions. Izuku scowled a moment later as a familiar scarf wrapped around him tightly. Don't think you'll just be left free. Aizawa stated as he walked forward and took the knife away from him. Now then, why did you bring the idiot here, on your back, passed out? I can answer that. Recovery girl interrupted as she stepped away from the blonde hero. He had two broken ribs and his already damaged lung had been perforated. Idiot probably didn't notice it at all due to the little bit of lung he had left on that one. She explained. Also, the news. With that she flicked on the TV that was in the corner to reveal a news channel going over that afternoon's villain attack. The teachers all watched the news of the slime villain's attack appeared, along with a grainy video of Ground Zero facing the slime monster that was wrapped around a green-haired man, shoving itself down his throat. Then All Might appeared and blasted the villain off of the man, revealing it to be the one they had in their custody. He overdid it and I'm assuming this young man knew that and so brought him here to be healed. She explained before walking over to the girl and looking her over. Izuku sighed in relief as the video playing and the nurse said basically everything that had happened. Maybe now he could actually be really a dot 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 the scarves tightened around him, making him grunt in slight pain. Or maybe they'd just be even more suspicious about why he was here. Damn it, why are you here? Aizawa questioned with his eyes glowing red. You could have just left him where he was, you didn't need to bring him here yourself. Izuku huffed as he glared at the hero. 
It was annoying when he had to deal with heroes who all think they knew everything. First of all, using your quirk. On me is pointless. I'm quirkless so save. It for something more. Important. He coughed more. Getting really tired of having to deal with it even though he knew there was nothing he could do about it at the moment. Quirkless. Aizawa's frown became more pronounced as he released his quirk. Then why? Izuku glanced over where Recovery Girl was working on Tashinori before glancing over where he was covered with a blanket and sleeping peacefully. All Might dot 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 is my hero. He stated as he turned not to Aizawa but to Nezu. I've dot 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 been following him, since I was young. Frowns on all the heroes' faces proved he had gotten their attention. He dot 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 came to me dot 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 for information. Ah, uh, Nezu said as he raised a finger in a light bulb moment. The heroes turned towards the principal in confusion even as he turned to Aizawa. Release him please. We don't want to be getting on the nerve of the greatest information broker in the world. It was silent for a long moment before Izuku let out a sigh as the scarf unraveled and released him. So, you figured it out finally. I was, wondering if the high-spec quirk worked into you, was still at high proficiency. Nezu watched the young man as he leaned forward in his seat towards the mouse dog-like creature. An emerald and ruby eye stared into the dark eyes of the principal. It dot 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 is dot 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 even higher than it dot 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 was when you dot 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 were created. Nezu smiled at that before nodding his head. It seems you know more than you should. He turned to the nurse. Can you heal him? Listening to him talk is like listening to nails on a chalkboard. But of course, the old woman said as she finished up with the blonde and then turned to the young green-haired man. Now open up Deary so I can see the damage. Izuku smiled and nodded his head as he bent his body downwards and opened his mouth, almost choking when a tongue suppressor was shoved onto his tongue and a light shined to reveal his throat. Oh dear, you have quite the torn up throat. I'm surprised you've been able to talk at all. She stated as she released him, Izuku quickly working his jaw so that the slight ache would disappear. Now hold still. She demanded as she grabbed hold of his hand and planted a large smooch onto it. Izuku blinked in surprise as he felt energy flow through him and then exit out of him in a whoosh. He gave a cough as his throat healed fully and exhaustion overrode his body. I feel much better, thank you. He gave to the woman as he slumped back in his chair. Is Uri all right? No side effects from her quirk, right? She's fine. Just exhausted and a mild fever. She'll be fine completely soon. She explained calmly as she popped out several gummas into his hand that lay in her own. You'll be fine as well. A good sleep and you'll be right as rain again. Thank you very much ma'am. The young man popped the gummas into his mouth, enjoying the flavor and the boost of energy they gave him. God, if only I had access to you before shit hit the fan. Many say that. She chuckled before turning to the rest of the group of heroes. Now then, they'll all be fine. Get on out of here and get to where you need to be. You can question them later when they're well rested. I'm sure you know they aren't a danger to this school after all. Nezu met the woman's eyes before nodding in agreement. All right then, everyone back to your stations. He whipped around and turned to the door with the confused heroes watching him. He came to a stop at the open door though, hands behind his back as his tail lashed behind him viciously. Though know that if you step one millimeter out of line in my school, I will know, and I will make sure you will not live to see another mistake. Izuku felt a shiver run down his back before he grinned at the little creature, super possessive and protective as well. Izuku stated, I'll make sure to make those primary notations in your files. Do keep those to yourself though. We don't need another creation like me getting around. Nezu's tail slammed into the ground and Izuku watched the formation of a crater from that simple flick. No worries. They'd have to get past my barriers and security measures to get that information. You dot 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 have the files dot 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 on how I was made. The creature's voice wavered for a second as the tail froze. Of course, Izuku watched that tail, he knew what it could really do. Only I have the information now and that was only because I recovered the files that survived that night dot 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 and then I burned them. His grin widened as the tail began to swish again, this time lazily and calmly. I watched them turn to ash and then mixed it into paint that now covers my completely destroyed office thanks to Endeavor. Then I won't worry about it. Nezu sing song as he walked out of the room with all of his teachers but one behind him. Going to babysit me then. Izuku questioned as his dual-colored eyes turned towards the scarf-wearing hero. Don't you have a class to teach? Unless you expelled an entire class again. Expelled dot 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 them all. A voice said from the side of the room with the beds. He dot 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 h at s and found another. Glass. Movement and the two watched as Tashinori sat up, recovery girl at his side in a nanosecond. Huffing had Izuku and Aizawa signed together before walking over to the man's bedside to watch as recovery girl did a little more work. Seems like you're alright then. Aizawa drawled. I'm alright. The blonde hero said with a grin. Nothing that can keep me down for long. Not if you keep doing stupid shit like that. Izuku stated with a sigh and ran a hand over his face. Which reminds me, you will sit down with recovery girl and let her teach you what you can and can't eat, drink, or do anymore. He glared down at the blonde hero. The racer head was able to watch in amusement as the young man with green hair tore into the number one hero even as he bounced to talk with recovery girl about possible treatments to help make his life less arduous. It seems that you found a babysitter of your own, Yagi. Aizawa stated as made eye contact with the other man. However will you be a hero when you have a guardian? Not a guardian. Toshinori stated as he looked at Izuku with a fire in his eyes that Aizawa hadn't seen in years. 
a fire that burned and warmed the body of the person it roamed in. He's much more than a guardian. The scarf-wearing hero's eyes narrowed as he straightened his back. What are you getting at here, Yagi? Eyes flashed red in irritation. I'm kinda wondering that as well. Shuzenji said as she climbed into her spinning chair and settled into it. This boy dot 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 he's the information broker of analysis. He's the one who gave me the information needed to find a successor of my own not too long ago. Which she was thankful for. Kikeya was a marvelous young girl who had a quirk similar to Recovery Girl's own. Able to heal using the other person's energy, though she didn't have to kiss but merely touch them. Soon Shuzenji would be able to retire and leave the school in more than capable hands. Yeah, I remember that girl showing up out of nowhere. Aizawa said as he remembered the girl as well. Kind and sweet, powerful with her quirk as well. Especially in the medical field. It was lucky they got to her when they did. She lived in the slums of New York City, used by one of the gangs there. Izuku said as he leaned against the wall between the two beds. He looked down at Uri's sleeping face. Used for her quirk to heal the gang members. One after another, a gun to her head or a needle to the arm to get her to comply. He remembered that girl exceptionally well. I went and picked her up myself. Earned myself a souvenir from that trip. He grinned as he pulled up his shirt to reveal a long scar that started at his belly button and wrapped around his stomach to his back where it disappeared from sight. You should see her soon, she's be wondering about you. Shuzenji said with a smile before becoming serious again. There's only one reason Tashinori went to see you. Am I wrong? No, you're not. Tashinori spoke up again, leaning heavily against several pillows with that grin on his face still. You're not guessing wrong at all and you should assume a lot of things. He couldn't find you a successor. Aizawa stated with a shake of his head. You had one shot and it blew up in your face because of your sidekick's death. Lemillion was a dead end, yes. He agreed with a nod of his head. But he wasn't the only person worthy of receiving my power. His eyes hadn't left Izuku once since this began and the boy had realized this. What are you talking about? Izuku questioned as he put his eyes on his all-time favorite hero. I've looked at everyone on this planet over. Quirkless or not, none of them fit what you're looking for. There's no one else able to take the power of one for all and use it correctly. You looked at other people. Tashinori said as he made sure to keep his eyes trained on the boy. A boy that had run into danger to save another person, despite the danger to himself. A boy that just admitted to saving a girl that had suffered at the hands of others because she needed the help and because Recovery Girl needed her own successor. A boy who had saved another little girl from another gang because she was scared and hurting and needed the help. A boy who had gone out of his way to help an old hero looking for his own successor and had done everything to help him find them. All of which had happened. This boy had led him straight to his successor, without ever even knowing it. I hate it when you get that look. Aizawa's hand ran through his hair before staring at the hero that still had his eyes only on the boy. A look that spoke of determination, stubbornness, and anticipation. I hate that look. You hate it but I love it. He remembered that look himself, from that very same video that showed the debut of his favorite hero. That look that said everything would work out and everything would be okay. That he was there and that nothing would happen to you. He had seen it over and over and over again. Ever since he was three years old and knew how to work that computer, he would watch it over and over again. Just so he could see that look that kept him entrance his entire life. So, who is this great successor then? Aizawa questioned with a raised eye. Tashinori's grin widened as he raised a hand and pointed it straight at the 19-year-old boy next to his bed. Analysis. He's not here. A familiar deep voice said as they wandered around the room, looking at random files and going through cabinets to see if they could find anything useful. I didn't know that Midnight's favorite color was purple. A high-pitched giggle. How he hated that giggle though at the same time he enjoyed what that giggle meant. Manic and evil and viciousness normally followed that giggle and he couldn't wait to see what she would do next. All this information in this building is general, well-known, nothing of important. A voice called to him. I have a feeling that he doesn't keep anything of important here at all. Turajiri is still looking around on the next floor. We got that newbie looking around downstairs as well. What was his name? The girl asked. Rappa. The other boy said with a shrug. Super powerful but lost to overhaul each and every time. Will he be able to do what we want though? I heard he lost to that really fat hero that looks like an orange marshmallow. Himiko, that's what the girl's name was. He remembered now. She liked blood. Yeah, he would have won against Fat Gum if that rock hard boy wasn't there with him. Dabai, fire, a lot of firepower to that boy indeed. He was one of the more useful players in this game of his. Sensei even agreed with that as well. He'll be useful later on. Well that's good to know. Silence for a second before a squeal. This is me. They got his attention. A file on you. He questioned as he stood up from the desk to look at the girl in a schoolgirl's uniform. She hadn't changed at all in the last four years since they met up. Are you the only one? Nope. She popped the pee as she pulled out several more files. Dabai, Rappa, Kurajiri, Tamura, and even Sensei was in here. All the members of the League of Villains, free or otherwise, were right here. They were all basic profiles, pictures included, but these were even more detailed than the police profiles that were made for only a handful of them. But here, they were all here. Every single member of the League, right there in front of his eyes. Even those that he had kept hidden in the dark and out of the picture until the time was right. There was even profiles on Namu, all of the Gnomus. How is this possible? He muttered to himself as he ran over the basic information on himself. 
His eyes narrowed though when he found information on his parents. They died during a villain attack and he had been left behind by all the cops and heroes. Sensei had found him afterwards and took him in, taught him all he knew. But it was a name next to his father's name. A name he recognized from his teachings of Sensei. A name that shouldn't be associated with his at all, since it was a predecessor of one for all. Nana Shimura, the seventh successor and once upon pro hero. She was apparently his grandmother. Another secret hidden from him by his sensei. One he wasn't sure he agreed with or liked at all. One thing was for sure, he'd be having words with his sensei about this sooner than later. Is there anything we've found here at all? Shigaraki barked out as he threw the file down on the ground and turned to his party. Anything we can use or put to use. Nothing here. Dab I said with a shrug. Just general information that anyone can get off of the internet. There is nothing in the rooms above. Kirajiri appeared next to him from a portal. Just bedrooms with pictures of, I'm assuming, the one who runs this place and a girl. There are pictures of a young boy with a woman with similar looks as well. He pulled out two pictures. One showing the young boy with green hair and freckles and a woman with green hair and green eyes. She was chubby and short while the boy towered over her with a smile despite being a teen. The second picture showed a young man with green hair that was slicked back on one side, the side that had a horrific burn that trailed down part of his face, down to his neck and disappeared under his shirt. A nice white button-up dress shirt with the first few buttons undone with a black suit vest. He also wore nice black pants with shiny black shoes. In his arms was a little girl, her arms around his neck with a shy smile. The little girl was blonde with a little horn poking out of one side of her forehead with wide crimson eyes. She wore a long pink shirt with a white fluffy skirt and black Mary Janes. This is him. He held the picture up with the older man and little girl. I'm assuming so, yes, Kurajiri said with a nod. They weren't upstairs so I'm assuming that they must be out at the moment. Hey, can I fight Endeavor? Rappa called up from the lower part of the building. Endeavor, Shigaraki questioned and blinked as he did so. Number two hero. He mumbled, wondering if it would be okay to fight him or not. We should leave now. The last thing we need is for him to know we've come looking for him. Kurajiri stated. Sir will know what we need to do to get him into our hands. He nodded to himself before looking to where Rappa was standing just within the door of the stairs. We'll leave. We don't have time to deal with that wannabe hero. He nodded to Kurajiri and a portal appeared. Let's leave. We'll come up with a game plan to take the information broker as our own. With that he led the group through the portal and back to the bar that was their headquarters. Analysis. Izuku looked behind him, but the only one there was a passed out area in the window to the outside. Then he looked back at the finger pointing directly at him. He then raised his own finger at his face and blinked in confusion. Toshinori nodded his head in agreement and big grin on his face. You have got to be shitting me. Aizawa glared at the man before looking at the boy. He's an information broker. He has information on Principal Nezu that no one else does and you just want to give him one of the most powerful quirks of all time. Toshinori blinked and turned to his fellow teacher. And yeah I've seen him refuse to give information to Ground Zero, Endeavor, give simple information and an olive branch to another that needed help. He has taken in a little girl who needed help and then saved another one. Has he asked for anything in return? As he turned that little girl, he pointed at Uri in a weapon that could destroy the world. Aizawa stood there with a glower on his face and hands clenched tightly. This kid dot 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 he'll be trouble. The blonde hero laughed at that as he nodded. That's what I was for Nana. I was trouble, a quirkless kid that was trouble and almost destroyed so many things. He stated as his eyes became covered in film and far off. It took me a bit to gain control and to learn what it meant to be a hero. That doesn't mean you should choose the first quirkless kid off the street that you meet. The shout startled both other males and got a squeak from the little girl. You okay, Uri? Izuku asked as he sat on the edge of the bed and pulled the girl into his side. It's okay. He's just a little frustrated with Toshinori-san. He explained as the girl looked at Aizawa with wide distrustful eyes. He's angry. She stated calmly, pursing her lips. Is it because he doesn't like you? Izuku chuckled as he ran a hand through her hair. Isn't that most people who walk into our home? He questioned back with a smile. It's fine. He doesn't have to like me. Is it because you got burned? Because you're quirkless? Because you helped me? Her voice got lower and quieter and spoke like her whole world was ending. Nothing like that. Izuku assured, continuing with the hair brushing. Just a big decision to be made, especially when he just met me. But, she frowned as she pushed away from him and looked at Aizawa, both meeting eyes and holding stern. You saved me. You haven't done anything wrong. You constantly come home injured because you have to save a cat from a tree and fall out of the tree doing so. She just about screeches as her horn extends and a glow begins to form. Izuku's eyes widened at this and he turns to Aizawa. Quirk. Now. He shouts as he leaps away from the girl. Aizawa doesn't wait to ask questions but just does as told. His hair flies up and his eyes glow red. A light disappears and the girl falls forward. The boy doesn't even wait a second and scoops her up into his arms and cuddles her to his chest. Hey, are you okay? He whispered to her as he nosed her hair. Him fine. She mumbled as she snuggled into him. I just don't dot 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 like it when people judge dot 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 you dot 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 without knowing you. Izuku sighed as he kept her up against his body. Anyways, what do you mean me? You can't give me one for all. He stated as he moved further onto the bed so that he could settle Iri onto his crossed legs. You need someone who can become a hero to be the pillar you are. And that can be you. Tashinori stated with a smirk. 
There are people who become heroes long after they graduated high school. You can still get your license and become a hero. Izuku froze. Yuri blinked sleepily up at him, wondering why his body had gone from soft and warm to stiff and cold. Izzy, she questioned. Say. He clenched his jaw tight, his arms wrapped around Yuri a little bit tighter. Can you dot 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 can you say that dot 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 say that again? Tashinori grinned wide as he looked at the boy. His eyes were shadowed and his hair was falling forward, hiding his face. Yuri was looking up with a face that was confused and worried. Izuku Midoriya, you young man, can become a hero. He stated with his hand held out to the other. Hiri's eyes widened when little droplets fell onto her face, streaking down as more and more fell. Izzy, she asked again as she reached up with a hand, catching tears on her fingers. He felt a weight on his chest and shoulders push against him. His head became clouded, nose became plugged, his breathing became erratic, and his body felt just heavy. He knew this feeling well and he didn't miss it. But he needed to feel it. Again, he choked out as he clutched at the girl in his lap. You can be a hero, Izuku, Tashinori said again as he realized exactly what this young man needed. He didn't know everything, but he knew that feeling of being quirkless and being told he couldn't be a hero. That feeling of being unable to reach a goal that he so desperately wanted but not being able to do so. He knew it well. He also knew the feeling of being vindicated and how great it felt when he did show them all wrong. How great he felt when he was told he could be a hero. That was a weight that lifted off his shoulders and he spent almost all day crying in relief. That was what was happening right here. You can be a hero, Izuku Midoriya. You can be exactly what you've always wanted to be. You can take my power and be the pillar of peace we both know you can be. He paused and watched the tears continue to flow down those pale cheeks, one blistered with a burn scar so bad that healing quirks couldn't even fade it. There's a way to tell a hero before they become one. Easily as well. Their stories and how they start. Aizawa groaned at this as he knew what it was. The same way he knew he was going to become a hero and the same with Yamada. Their bodies moved on their own. That's what happened at the cafe today, your body moved without you thinking about it. That tells me you will be a great hero. One the world needs desperately. He explained as he waved his arms around before holding them still out at his sides with that big grin on his face. You can be a hero Midoriya my boy. All you have to do is accept my power as your own. Izuku couldn't believe what was being offered to him. The chance to live a life that he thought he could never have. The pain and the suffering he underwent when he was younger because he was quirkless and powerless to stop it all. How it all hurt and he was left to suffer by himself for a very long time. God how this all felt so surreal and fake. Again, he gasped out once more. Tashinori. All Might repeated. You can be a hero. It was said softly this time and calmly, as if the other knew exactly how bad this was hurting and yet helping him. He most likely did. Izuku knew what his past was after all and knew the pain the other had suffered well. So because he knew what the other went through, knew the condition he was in, and knew what would happen after he gave it up dot 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 he did the only thing he could. He reached out without looking and waved his hand around until it was grabbed by another skeletal hand and held tight. Two little hands followed and they landed on his cheeks, catching the tears falling and wiping them away as fast as they reappeared. I'll do it. He said as he looked up with a shaky smile and tears still falling down his face. He had hoped that he had gotten over the crybaby bullshit but apparently he hadn't. I'll be the ninth successor. Tashinori's smile widened as he nodded. You will be a great hero. Now eat this. A single blonde hair was held out towards the young man, testing the waters. He stared at the picture in his hand, his pinky held off of it so it wouldn't disintegrate. He had been staring at this picture for hours now, trying to figure out why this picture held so much significance to him and why it had held his attention for so long. Never had he looked at a picture like this, like it held all the secrets to the world and all he had ever wanted to know. Those eyes were one of the things that his eyes always moved back to. One very familiar crimson eye he had seen before, but calmer and more focused. The crimson eyes he remembered were wild, filled with rage and determination that would burn you alive if you stared for too long. He remembered those eyes and this one was similar to those. Different in a way but still the same determination. He wondered if that new hero had caused this man to lose his other emerald eye and had been forced to give blood to grow this one. After all, that one doctor could grow new organs or limbs for a person as long as they had the blood of the one who had taken that limb in the first place. It wouldn't be surprising if that is what happened this time around as well. What are you thinking Shigaraki Tamura? Sensei dot 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 when did he call? What is it that you hold? A picture found at analysis when we went for the information broker. He replied distractedly, running a finger over the man's face again, blocking out the crimson eye to stare at the emerald. That one spoke to him as well, a memory he had pushed away as unimportant years ago. It was blurry and unfocused due to the amount of time he had forgotten about it. It's of a young man with a burn covering half of his face and he's holding a little girl with a horn poking out of her forehead. He knew before his sensei had asked and so had explained what the picture held. Why does it hold your attention so? I didn't think anything but video games would be able to do that. He was silent for a long time, still trying to drag that memory out of the depths of his mind. It was important, he knew it was, but how it was, he didn't know. Something, something about him. There is something important. He mumbled, reaching a hand up and scratching at his neck in irritation. Something important, I have to remember. A slight burn as he scratched deep enough for blood to well, but he didn't care. It was helping him think so he continued to scratch. Would you like help? 
No, he snapped as he turned to the television with a glare. He knew what Sensei was talking about, but he wasn't going to allow that to happen again no matter what. It had torn his mind up so badly last time that he didn't want to spend a month in bed healing. It was a waste of time. I will remember on my own and then make a plan. Silence for a while, blissful. Kirajiri had gone out for supplies, Himiko went to kill for blood, and Dabai was lurking around somewhere but kept silent more often than not. His mind worked hard in the silence, nails scratching at his neck again, and Sensei kept silent as he continued to think. Flames. He spoke up finally as his hand stopped moving and his eyes widened in realization. That building that was destroyed in a confrontation between Endeavor and a villain. He remembered now why it was so important. He was there for that confrontation, out of sight and moving to get out. He hadn't wanted to fight the fake hero at all, no matter how fake he was, Endeavor was still powerful. Ah, I remember that as well. Quite the fight that built up several thousand money worth in damage and hundreds of casualties. Most of them were of the druggies, horse, and filth that died, but some were still just children and innocents. Yes, that's right. He had only escaped because he had called Kurajiri to pick him up. That's why he had survived. But what is it about that picture that has brought you back to that incident? He was there. He stated as he remembered. A boy with a horrific burn on the side of his face, his entire body covering a thin frail woman, protecting her the best he could from the fire. Now that he thought about it dot 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 he pulled over the other picture of the boy and woman. The boy had no scars and two bright emerald eyes, but it was the same one that stood with the little girl. The woman had been chubby in the picture but he remembered her being thin and rather attractive looking. He was there during the attack, protecting his mother. For the woman could be no one else. The same eyes and hair and facial structure. How is this important to you? Again with that question. He had gotten it from Kurajiri, Himiko, Jiren, twice, and Mr. Compress. It was getting really annoying having to ignore this question and just because it was Sensei, he'd answer it. Those eyes. He stated calmly as he remembered those eyes at that time. One ruby and one emerald. The reason why he went after Ground Zero when he was just a kid was because of those eyes he saw so long ago. Eyes filled with rage, hatred, and strangely enough envy. They were full of hate, even as he tried to protect that woman with his own body. HM dot 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 he reminds you of that man then. He blinked as his mind brought up a man with short black hair and kind brown eyes. Despite his own looks coming from his mother, Shigaraki knew that the man was his father. The hand on his face was his father's hand and he would never forget about him. His father had protected him from a villain's attack even at the cost of his life. He had used his own body until someone had shown up to destroy the villain. It wasn't a hero who had saved him. It wasn't a policeman who had saved him. It wasn't another villain who had saved him that day and then left him with the bodies of both of his parents. Sensei had found him not too long afterwards, even as the police had milled around processing the scene. Yes, he admitted as the image of his father covering his little body with his own overlaid the image of this boy doing the same for his mother. The hate for the hero is similar, different, but similar. He wouldn't be able to explain it further than that and Sensei knew this, so the two remained silent long after the TV turned off. Analysis. You have to be kidding me. Izuku stated with a deadpan face that made Aizawa just a little impressed. You want me to eat your hair? To pass on one for all, you'll have to ingest some of my DNA that was willingly given. Tashinori explained with a grin. That's the way that it is passed on. All you have to do is eat it. Are you even sure he can handle it? The teacher cut in real quick. He knew what this could do to the information broker. He looks like a twig after all. Izuku squawked at that even as the blonde man's smile brightened. He can. At that statement he reached over and pulled the boy up onto his feet and close to his bed. The boy squealed even as he dropped her back onto her own bed and made sure he was in between her and the hero. Before the boy or teacher could ask what was going on, Izuku's shirt was ripped right open, scattering buttons all over the room even as his vest buttons ripped through the actual vest. It was silent in the room for a long time after that as everyone in the room took in the situation. Tashinori just sat there smiling smugly as he revealed the younger man. Aizawa just stared at the boy's developed chest and abdominal muscles, along with the scar that covered most of the chest before tapering off towards the side and down his side along with the scar that wrapped around his stomach to his back. Harry was struggling not to giggle as she stared at the blank face of the eraser hero and the imagined look she came up for Izuku's own face, which wasn't too far off as the young man stared down at the blonde hero in exasperation, indignation, frustration, and bemusement all at once. Did you really need to destroy my clothes to get them off? He finally asked with a frown. All you'd have to do was ask. Aizawa just about choked on his spit while Tashinori let out a loud laugh. Recovery girl chuckled from where she was settled in the corner at her desk. I mean really Tashinori, you owe that young man some new clothes. She stated, and dinner. That earned a yelp from the blonde and a chuckle from Izuku. Aizawa buried his face into his scarves to hide the grin on his face. Well, whatever. The hero growled before turning back to Izuku. I've made my point, you'll be able to handle this power easily. So eat this. Once again the hair was held in front of the young man. Izuku went to say something but was stopped when the hair was shoved into his mouth and then a long and thin skeletal hand covered his mouth and nose. Izuku gulped on reflex in his surprise, almost gagging as he felt the hair slid down his throat at the same time. Good, now that's done, you'll have to start training for a hero license quickly. Aizawa rolled his eyes at the scene before sighing. 
he can go through UA to get it. I'm sure Nezu will want to keep an eye on him either way. Not to mention that he'll be close by for me to treat him. Recovery girl added quickly. I remember what you were like when you were still learning to use your power. She explained with a shrug as they all turned towards her. It wasn't exactly a walk in the park the entire time. Izuku gagged again before scrunching his face and forcing himself to several more times, finally feeling the hair slide further down his throat. God, that's disgusting. He muttered to himself, ruffling Eri's hair when he heard her giggling. What are you laughing at? I've seen you react the same way when I forced you to try the eggplant. He teased easily, laughing at the scrunched look of disgust on her face. Exactly. Now that that's done with, what now? Aizawa brought all of their attention forward. When will he start exhibiting abilities of your power? I'd give it a few hours, then he'll be able to try it out. Tashinori locked eyes with the other pro. We can use Jim Gamma to get him to have a taste of the power he'll have. Not a bad idea. Aizawa nodded in agreement before turning and leaving the room without another word. He'd have to get Cementos to come and help out. It was his building for a reason after all. Tashinori sighed in relief as he leaned back onto his bed and got comfortable. Things were finally starting to work out in a way that it hadn't in a long time. It was a relief to have a successor now and one that seemed so capable. He seemed to have finally gotten a weight off of those shoulders. Izuku said with a small smile, knowing that his own shoulders were now burdened with that relinquished weight. Yeah. The hero agreed easily as his head lolled backwards with his eyes closed and a smile on his face. Exhaustion washed over him and without him realizing it, he fell asleep. A peaceful sleep he hadn't felt in a long while. Izuku just smiled as recovery walked over to Iri and handed the girl a glass of water. It seems like he can finally relax and focus on himself. She said with a smile. Hopefully the last few years he has will be calm and quiet with little stress. He only has that long. Izuku questioned with a frown before he glanced at Iri with a smile creeping onto his face. That would have to wait though, there was still too much left up to chance if he did that now. Well, we'll just have to work together to make it a good one then. The two exchanged smirks while Iri looked back and forth in confusion. The adults are weird, she thought as she continued to drink her water. Analysis. Thanks again for agreeing to help us out Cementos. Toshinori said as he nodded at his fellow hero. This'll make it easier to control the situation he'll end up being in and the damage can be dealt with quickly. The brick-like hero nodded his head back. It is understandable and quite responsible of you to think of this. He admitted, remembering the way that the other had started out as a teacher. The trouble he had caused for the students and other teachers was still talked about even now. Something that isn't normal for you. The blonde man just scowled at that before turning towards the two other people that had come with them. Aizawa and Izuku both were looking rather blank at the moment, though that could be because they had been insulting the other on the way over before Cementos had covered their mouths with cement. Now, while he's busy building something for you to test your strength against, I need to explain how to do so. Izuku raised a brow and pointed at the cement around his mouth but the blonde hero just ignored it as he continued on. Now then, the power of one for all is a culmination of all of the previous wielders' power built upon one after another. He started with his arms crossed over his chest. You are the ninth wielder of one for all, so the power is rather built up and can cause a great deal of damage, but the most damage done will be to your body. Izuku's eyes widened at this as his arms fell to his sides and he tilted his head in worry and curiosity. If only he could ask a question about all of this. You were born quirkless, so you haven't had the time that most have to build up to this power. You'll be starting from scratch and using it, not to mention that you'll be unable to use most of the power all at once without breaking something, until you've figured out how to use smaller increments and build into it. A rumble and soon Izuku was able to watch the cement base hero build up several mountains within the building. All of them were in a straight line that led from the front of the building to the back. It is ready. Cementos called as he walked over to them. Shall I remove the gags? The sigh was exaggerated and unneeded. I guess, I'm going to miss the silence. That's not funny. Aizawa stated instantly as Izuku was busy working his jaw to make sure there weren't any kinks. Don't do that again or I'll make sure you suffer dot 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 both of you. His hair flew up and his glare landed on the other two heroes. I'll keep that in mind, Cementa said compromisingly while Tashinori just chuckled. Now then, I believe we are here to test a quirk. Right. The green-haired young man stepped forward, cracking his knuckles in preparation. How do I do this? Aizawa groaned in annoyance, ignoring the blue-eyed glare sent his way. Just focus some of your attack in your hand and throw a punch. The blonde waved his hand towards the mountains. Izuku took in a deep breath as he stepped forward, concentrating on his fists as he prepared for his first ever use of a quirk. He took one more deep breath, clenched his fist, and threw it forward with all of his might. He blinked his eyes when absolutely nothing happened. You really do need to concentrate, Tashinori said as he settled on the ground calmly. Try and find that center within that holds all of the power, push it forward into your fist, and use that to attack. Aizawa pulled his sleeping bag out of nowhere and got comfortable on the floor. It looked like this was going to take a little bit. I'll be asleep if anyone needs me. No you won't, Tashinori snorted but concentrated on the green-haired young man. The boy was standing there with his arms still outstretched, brows furrowed and a frown on his face. It was obvious that he was trying to find that place he needed. He knew it would be hard. There wasn't any doubt about that since he had never had a quirk. He never knew how they used their powers and he didn't know how he was going to use this one. 
one that was his own now and one he had to make his own. Make his own. All Might uses his fists to fight, uses them to protect, and uses them to win. That was All Might, though. He wasn't All Might. He was the son of Inko Midoriya. He was the guardian of Uri. He was the owner of Analysis. He was Izuku Midoriya. That was what he needed to be. He didn't need to be a second version of All Might. This wasn't like a video game where a 2.0 version was made to surpass the last. So he didn't need to think of this like that but in a different way. He was a person that could possibly continue the legacy that the other had created dot 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 or he could make his own path and leave his own legacy. Continuing that though, maybe it wasn't his fists that he needed to use in fights. Though he would use them in battle, they weren't really his main weapons in the first place. In all of his fights against heroes or villains that came to him, when they became physical and he ran out of all traps to thwart their attempts, his legs were the first things to lash out. His feet connecting with faces, solar plexus, kneecaps, and other body parts. His knees breaking noses and bones. His legs and feet and knees were his main weapons. He had taken Muay Thai, kickboxing, Taekwondo, and so many other martial arts. He had to be strong in body and mind when he had nothing else. That was why he had been able to hold his own for so long against quirks of all kind. Because he could fight them. And that was how he found out that his greatest weapons had been his legs. Deadly to a point and more so after he started wearing steel toe boots, shin guards, and metal knee pads. It helped that his legs had been strong from years of running away in all shapes and forms. He had to be faster than those who wanted to torture for the information in his head or to kill him for having that information. So his fists weren't his main weapons. No, it was his legs that were. So he had to keep that in mind when he pulled forth the power that was crackling underneath his skin. He could feel it there, in his core near his heart. Pushing it into his fists hadn't worked because they weren't the first things he thought about when he got into a fight. No, it was his legs that he used first. He adjusted his stance in an instant, eyes beginning to glow as he called upon the power that rushed through his veins. The three teachers all stiffened when they felt the air charged with power, all eyes turning to the man whose stance had changed completely. He isn't going to kick, is he? Aizawa questioned with a frown. He had rarely seen All Might kick, always attacking with his fists. It seems that is exactly what he's going to do. Cementus agreed calmly, preparing to set up a wall as the power increased around them. He is using it dot 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 his own way. Toshinori gasped out with surprise and pride. It had taken him several years after receiving one for all to find his own way. He had used Nana's style for a while after he received the quirk. God this kid was surprising him all over the place. The power continued to crackle around him more and more, building to a dangerous level. He had to release it soon or it would tear him apart on the inside. So he lashed out with his leg, a sweep downwards that sent a scythe of power at the mountains. All watched as the length of the mountains were crushed under the release power and it traveled even further, destroying the back of the building and the forest behind the building. Good thing the building was located out in the woods and away from civilization. Izuku stood there for a long moment, his legs stretched out in front of him while all of his weight was settled on his other leg, staring at the destruction he had just caused with wide eyes. Holy shit, he mumbled in disbelief. He had known he had this power, but to see it in action was, quite frankly, badass. I would have to agree. Toshinori grinned as he stepped up next to the boy. He settled a hand onto that shoulder just in time to allow that boy to fall into him. You all right? No. Izuku gritted out as he forced his weight onto his one good leg, using the blonde as a crutch as the pain registered in his mind. He thought it would be worse honestly. Let's get you to recover a girl. Toshinori said with concern, even though he knew that this would happen. Don't want you walking around on a broken leg after all. Not broken. He grunted out as he settled weight on his leg, hissing at the pain but holding it. Maybe cracked but not completely broken. Toshinori blinked in amazement at that but then shook his head. We'll get you looked at either way. Don't need you destroying yourself before you even truly begin. He said as he wrapped one of the boy's arms around his neck and began to help the other wobble walk. Yeah. Izuku chuckled as Aizawa walked over to his other side and slung an arm around his waist and then Izuku's own over his shoulder. That'd be embarrassing. Aizawa snorted at that. More like pathetic. But then again, Toshinori has always been rather pathetic, especially in his teaching career. The young man could only chuckle as the number one hero squawked indignantly at his fellow teacher. I've gotten better. The blonde could only scowl at the chuckles from the other teachers and broker. How dare they mock him and his teaching skills, even if they were lacking. Don't worry, you have a great example to follow right here. Izuku pulled lightly on the scarf here his hand. He knows what he's doing when he teaches his students. The erasure hero scowled even as a small amount of pride filled his chest. I worried about my decision in turning Bakugo into a hero though, I do admit. Thinking about the blonde always made his hackles rise, along with the pride of how far that angry frightful child had gotten. You weren't wrong to. Izuku admitted with a sigh as they got to the bus and onto it, settling down so that they could be driven back to the main campus where Recovery Girl would be waiting. Kakin was always temperamental, and it only got worse as he got older. His hand ran over the scar on his face and the red eye that flared with familiar anger before shaking his head. But he did get better after he attended UA. Thank God for that too, or I don't think the world could have handled it otherwise. He laughed at that. Aizawa frowned at the boy, taking in the scar on his face fully for the first time in the ruby eye. 
He knew there was a man with a quirk that could replace limbs or organs that were destroyed in attacks, but only if the DNA of the attacker was given willingly. It seemed that was what had happened to this boy here. And that scar dot 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 he had seen singed marks similar to those scars when he had an explosive student in his class. It seems that the boy had caused much more damage before UA than he had thought. He sighed at that but then let it go. There was nothing he could do about it now and it seemed that this young man held no ill will towards his once student. Especially with that adorable little nickname. He would make sure to use it when he next saw Ground Zero and tease him relentlessly. Boy, he would have a field day with that. The smirk on his face caused all three people on the bus with him to shiver and slide away from him. None of them liked that smirk and feared for whoever it was directed to. On a pathway, a certain blonde felt a shiver crawl up and down his spine, causing him to curse at whoever had it out for him now. But you know, I've always known that Kekin was meant to be a hero. Izuku continued, ignoring the dark and rather villainous aura in the bus. He always had the drive and determination for it, so it didn't surprise me when he got in. He tilted his head to the side with a wistful smile on his face. I wish I could have gone with him at the time but I was still healing in the hospital while my mom worked extra hours to pay the hospital bills. So he did cause those. Aizawa sighed with a shake of his head. If I had known, he would have never been allowed to become a hero. Ah, good that you did not know then. Cementa stated, speaking up for the first time in a while. The boy does have anger problems, there is no denying that, but he is a fine hero that has saved hundreds of people. With thousands of dollars in property damage. He countered in a nanosecond. That's something he never seemed to figure out, unlike the rest of my students, all of whom succeeded in their chosen field of heroism. The Erasure hero could only smirk at that. A full class of 20 that he had managed to turn into heroes dot 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 one even being a student that had transferred from general education. That was something to brag about. Yes, yes, we all have heard you commend all of your students before. Cementos rolled his eyes as the other two chuckled. Yeah, and all of them have made a pass through my office as well, so I can say I've met all of your students. Izuku revealed a moment later. They're all rather interesting, though mind I kicked out after he made a few too many lewd comments. His eyes narrowed and all three heroes got a sense of danger before it disappeared. I think my favorites were Todoroki, Uravity, and Ingenium. They were all rather polite and kind, even made appointments unlike some of the others that just walked in. He shrugged as Tashinori chuckled nervously and scratched at his cheek. Not like I'm not used to it and you at least asked to see if you could make an appointment before we sent you up. Meanwhile, Aizawa growled lowly to himself. He had thought he had taught those brats manners and to hear that only a few had been polite to a civilian pissed him off. He didn't expect it of Bakugo, but the others all knew how he thought they should act when interacting with someone that could be helpful to them. Being rude and demanding information was not the way to go and he hoped that most of them asked for information politely even if they just barged in. We're here. He grumbled as he stood up to get off the bus, Cementos and Tashinori helping the boy off and towards Recovery Girl. I want all the names of those who didn't make an appointment with you from my class by the end of the day. He stated to the teen as he took off, done with them for the moment. He needed a break. Sure. Izuku nodded his head to the man's back as he was led off to where Recovery Girl and Iri were waiting for them. Hopefully this doesn't take too long. I have to get back to my office and see the damage from whoever's been there. He grumbled tiredly. Yes, well, depending on the break, you may be staying the night. The cement hero warned carefully. He knew how people could get, especially younger ones, when it came to having to stay in one place for too long. Izuku grumbled slightly as they got to the infirmary and opened the door, only to stop cold at the sight before them. At least for the two heroes it was a shock. For Izuku it was normal and occurred more often than he liked to admit some days. Izzy, he cried out in excitement from her place on the infirmary bed, a plate of little finger sandwiches, crackers, celery, and red peppers in front of her. You're just in time to eat with me and go. Izuku could only sigh and give her a tired smile before turning to the man sitting across from the young girl. It just seems you can't get enough of me today, Hakakan. Flaming ruby eyes met mismatched ones with a scowl on his face. We need to talk Deku. The tone of the blonde's voice caught the other's attention, all of theirs in fact, causing stern looks to fall on their faces. A note was left at your office dot 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 from the League of Villains. Chapter 5. Breaking the Barriers. Everything was burning. The building was burning down and he was inside with his poor mother, trying to drag her out and get her to safety. He wasn't even sure why Endeavor had come to the building and set it ablaze like he had. Just lit it up while chasing a shadow across the walls and floors, as if that was the only being in the building worth looking at. He grunted as he struggled to carry his mother towards the stairs. She had lost a lot of weight in the last months due to his hospitalization and the bills that came along, but that didn't make her easy to carry. Come on mom, wake up. He grunted at her, moving one foot after another. The sound of something breaking behind him made him drop his mother to the floor and cover her with his own body, just in time for burning wood to drop directly on top of his back. He screamed in pain and horror, his eyes frantically looking around to see if there was anyone there that could help them. But there was no one but already dead bodies of druggers and strung out prostitutes. The building had been filled with them when they had first moved here and now they were still there but dead or dying. All because of a hero. He growled as he struggled to get out from under the wood, ignoring the burning that came along with the fire. 
He had to get his mother out of there. She didn't deserve to die like this. She worked so hard to get better and had just barely paid a little over half of the hospital bills. She was almost free. She didn't deserve to go out like this. Footfalls were coming near them as he coughed and struggled. He turned his head to the side to watch as white boots came into view. Help! He cried out as Endeavor walked by. The hero stopped and stared at the boy over the woman. He sneered at them as soon as he took in their position and situation before continuing on as if they didn't exist. Izuku's eyes widened in horror as he realized what was going to happen. They were going to be burned alive and all because that jackass wasn't bothering to help them like a hero was supposed to do. He growled as anger pooled in his stomach at the rejection of a hero, someone supposed to protect and save them, only to leave him to die here with his mother in a fire that the hero had caused to begin with. He wasn't going to allow it, so he pushed. He pushed with all he had until he felt the wood on top of him shift and then slide off of his back into the ground. His mother was unharmed but his back was blistered and charred from the wood. He gritted his teeth though. He needed to get them out. So he knelt and positioned his mother until she was against his back, choking back his scream as he lifted her up onto his back and held here there by her thighs. He needed to get them out of that building and he would do it. Fuck the heroes if they didn't want to help him do it. Analysis. He stared at his office with a blank face. He was still burnt and torn apart from previous heroes and villains attacking it. But now it was filled with all the front portfolios on the ground, torn apart and ripped and destroyed. There was only one left intact and on his desk. Tamira Shigaraki, the leader of the League of Villains. Aizawa said as he looked over the file. The grandson of Nana Shimura, the seventh wielder of One for All. The teacher looked up and at the information broker. What about the note? Izuku shrugged as he stared at the note, unsure of what to make of it. Not a whole lot to it. He began before reading it out loud, maybe it would make more sense if he did that. I would like to extend an invitation to join the League. I remember you from the burning building four years ago that Endeavor had caused. I regret now not pulling you from under that pile of wood because you would have been by my side already if I had. Oh joy, he's offering you to join him. The Erasure hero rolled his head as he remembered how the League had once tried to pull back Hugo in with them so long ago. Luckily they had tracked them down before anything could happen to the team, but they had let the entire League escape in doing so. What will you do now? Obviously I'm going to continue my business and taking care of Uri. Izuku sighed as he began to pick up the torn apart portfolios, tossing them into a large black bag he had pulled from his desk earlier. I'll ignore them just like I've ignored every offer from other agencies and villains. Aizawa watched the young man clean his office for a long moment. They'll come after you. So, he quickly tied up the black bag after he had filled it up and began on the second bag of the mess. They won't be the first ones. His eyes flashed as he shot a look at the pro. They won't be the last either. It was obvious that this kid knew exactly what he was getting into. What did he mean by a burning building? Aizawa knew when to change the subject and so he did. Not like he needed to get on this kid's bad side any more than he already was. My mother and I had to move into a rundown apartment complex after I got out of the hospital when I was a teen. Izuku explained, quickly dumping more piles of files into a garbage bag. Didn't have enough money to stay in the one we had before due to the hospital expenses. He paused long enough to tie that bag off and get another. He was already almost done, thankful that he didn't store that many fakes as the actual information he held. Then Endeavor storms into the building, chasing something and sets the entire building on fire. So many people died, with me and my mom as possible casualties if I hadn't have gotten us out. Did he try and help anyone inside? Aizawa had always known Endeavor as ruthless and unwilling to help those unable to help themselves, but surely he wouldn't leave a teen there to die with his mother. He looked at me, sneered, and then walked out. Okay, it was official, Aizawa was going to destroy the jackass when he got the chance. Anyways, I've avoided him for years after that, but he found out about my information business and came to me to find more about All Might. Not like I would ever give him anything, but I did earn a cool 5 million yen from him that first transaction. He chuckled darkly as he remembered that. That jerk had come and asked for information and Izuku had given it after he had gotten the money. The fool only got what everyone else knew or could look up on the internet while Izuku took all of that money for himself. Thanks to that he had been able to buy this building and make it his own. Though a good portion had been used after Endeavor had come and burnt a portion of the office before Izuku could activate the water sprinklers. A good portion of that money was used to fix the building just after he had gotten it. The pro whistled, impressed with this kid. No one hardly ever got one over Endeavor like that, especially those that the flame user found beneath him. Nothing in the upper part of the building. That Hugo growled as he stomped down the stairs. It was left intact as well, nothing out of place. No hidden cameras either. Present Mike added on as well with a wide grin. You'll have to replace the desk and drawers downstairs but otherwise nothing out of place as well. All Might added on just before he puffed back to his skeletal form. He coughed and hacked up some blood but otherwise shrugged. Whatever they were looking for, they didn't find. They never will. Back Hugo turned to stare at his childhood friend as he crossed his arms over his chest. The shitty nerd never keeps anything on actual file. You want information, you pay him or be a telepath. And even then, a psychic wouldn't work on me. Izuku informed with a cold smile at the blonde explosion maker. The one time one tried, they spent a year in the psychiatric ward at the hospital and was retired from hero work. Oh, I heard brain matter had retired but no reason was given. 
President Mike whistled impressed. Aizawa could sympathize with that. God damn, there goes five hundred. Mac Hugo grumbled grumpily as he turned away from the other and kicked at the ground, ignoring how pieces of paper flew everywhere. Did you figure out anything from the note? Toshinori questioned as he stepped over to his successor. Only that he wants me to join the League of Villains and he knows about my encounter with Endeavor forever ago. Izuku informed with a shrug. Other than that, no, nothing. Do you think he'll come after you anytime soon? Mike turned to look at the teen, watching him closely. Maybe. Izuku paused and placed his chin in his hand to think, mumbling to himself as he thought. They could come anywhere between tonight to a month from now, but no more than that. They're eager to recruit me, most likely because of my information gathering skills and the information I already hold. Though that could also lead to me being killed because the file on Shigaraki held information no one but a few knew about. What information would that be? All Mike questioned in curiosity. He had known about Shigaraki since he had attacked the USJ back in Bakugo's first year at the school, but otherwise there hadn't been a whole lot of information on the team. He was the grandson of the one Nana Shimura. Izuku threw out carelessly, walking around his office. He was what? All Might shouted as he transformed and held the green-haired young man by the collar of his shirt. Izuku blinked in surprise before understanding entered his eyes. You didn't know that Nana had a son that had a son of his own. He stated before sighing. Put me down Tashinori. I'll explain. All Might took a deep breath before releasing the young man and returning to his weakened form. All right, how is Shigaraki Nana's grandson? How is that possible? I thought Sensei didn't have any children. You'd be wrong there, Izuku informed calmly. The child came before you knew Nana, about a year before actually. She gave him up though to adoptive parents, figuring that he would be safer if no one knew about him due to her reputation at the time. Yes, Sensei was always so strong. So strong that people purposely targeted Tashinori and Gran Torino because of their connection to her, hoping to weaken her in some way. To think that if they had tried to use her child against her, then yes, it was possible that child would have been hurt greatly if not outright killed. So dot 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 how did he become a villain? The cops didn't care, the heroes didn't come, a child left alone to suffer under the loss of his father. Izuku said after a moment of silence, not facing Tashinori as he spoke. Shigaraki had to watch as his father was killed directly in front of him by a villain and then no one helped to try and save him. They all just said a hero would come to help, that they'd leave it for a hero to deal with. More silence as the truth of the situation fell upon them all. What the fuck? Why are you all mopey all of a sudden? Bakugo questioned as he looked at the four other males. His eyes narrowed as he watched Izuku's head whip around to stare at him with wide eyes. What? He growled at the green-haired idiot. Izuku looked at the stunned faces of the three older pro heroes before turning fully to face the blonde. He realized rather quickly that he wasn't facing his old friend when he spoke to the heroes before as he took in his confused face, he could already tell what had happened. With that in mind, he made sure the other was paying attention to his lips before speaking. Are you not wearing your hearing aids, Kakin? Bakugo blinked before a hand raised to his ears and felt along them before scowling and glaring at the heroes. Not a damn word to anyone. He stated aggressively. Well shit, President Mike said with wide eyes. I should have known but then again, he was always so intuitive that it didn't seem to matter. He was deaf himself and used hearing aids and other support equipment to work as a pro hero. It was one of the many things on his profile that anyone could look up and he didn't really mind other people knowing. Though it seemed that Ground Zero had kept it a tight secret, so much so that not even Aizawa had known about it. That was a stupid thing to keep hidden, said teacher said with a scowl. Do you know how many people you could have put in danger with such a dumbass move? Oh shut it you insomniac. That Hugo growled out. It wasn't any fucking concern of yours anyways. I fucking had it dealt with. Izuku rolled his eyes, knowing exactly what the blonde was talking about. Yes, because as soon as I found out that he was deaf when we were kids, I spent months teaching him sign language, helping him learn to read lips, and feeling out the vibrations of his surroundings. Izuku stated matter of fact like, Shut up you fucking Deku. The pro roared at him, launching himself at the other with explosion spitting from his hands. Izuku just reached to the ground and picked up a bottle of baby powder and squeezed it directly into the other's face. I told you I already know how to disable your quirk without even trying. He stated with a roll of his eyes. Let's not destroy my office anymore anyways, I kinda need it if someone comes in asking for information. Hello? A voice called from downstairs at that moment. Is anyone up there? Speak of the devil. Come on up. Izuku called with a sigh before walking over to his desk and leaning against it. He'd have to deal with whoever it was that was coming up, but from the sound of the voice he could already guess at who it was. Gravity appeared at the door with a smile on her face. Sorry, I left a message on the phone but I never got a reply. She explained calmly, taking in the atmosphere, the destroyed office, and the other recognizable pro heroes in the room. Did I come at a bad time? No, Izuku assured with his own smile. You're here for the information on the twin destructions, correct? He moved behind his desk and searched through the mess of it, one he had caused and not villains. I have it right here, he said as he pulled out said file. Oh that's great, the woman said with a clap of her hands. Naomi and Sui will be able to track them down and get them arrested. They've been causing a lot of trouble around the bays and shipping yards lately. She explained as she flipped through the file, taking in the information quickly. Same fee as usual. Yep, that sounds about right. 
Izuku agreed and took the envelope filled with money easily. I hope to continue business with you soon. He replied as she nodded in agreement, tucking the file under her arm. Same here. Talk to you later. Nice seeing you guys again. She exclaimed before running out of the office in a hurry. It was obvious she wanted to catch the criminals as soon as possible. At least she has manners. Aizawa grumbled as he sent a glare at Bakugo, knowing that the teen would just barge in here whenever he felt like it. Yep, and a frequent customer as well. Izuku sighed before rubbing his neck. Well, since we've searched this place top to bottom, I guess we should head back to UA. So I can pick up Uri. I'm sure she's starting to get bored. Analysis. Do you think he'll join us like you think? Toga questioned curiously. She sat on the bar stool and swung her legs back and forth, as if she was a little kid waiting for her food and drink to be served. No clue. Shigaraki tapped the bar in thought, imagining those chromatic eyes. The blood ruby and the viridescent emerald. They burn with such a hatred that it caused a shiver to run up and down his spine in such a way that he couldn't help but grin. Those eyes reminded him of Ground Zero's own sparkling scarlet, filled with rage and bloodlust. Only these ones were much better. So much better because of how concentrated that look was and how honed it had been. Even in the picture he had gotten from the building showed that same rage hidden in his eyes, hiding what he really felt. He wondered how long it would be to turn this younger man to his side. How long would it take to unleash that hatred within him and make him turn on all he knew? Could he make the young man attack Ground Zero? Kill the girl? Destroy the rest of the world along his side? Oh, it would be perfect. All he had to do was convince the young man to join his side and make him his second in command. Sensei would love him as well, he could tell just by the looks the boy had. He reached into his pocket and pulled out the picture of the young man and the little girl. Those eyes. He ran a finger along his face gently, enjoying the look in those eyes greatly. No matter how hard this kid tried to hide that hate and anger and disgust in his eyes, there was still the shadow of all of those in his eyes. He had seen those same shadows in his eyes. When Sensei had first brought him to his base, he had fought against all that Sensei had stood for. He had wanted to be a hero or a detective like his father, had wanted to help the society to be good and safe. Then Sensei had shown him how heroes were taking everything. They were the ones to save, to put in danger, to build, or destroy a person. How the heroes were basically leaving many to suffer at the hands of criminal acts while the public adored and left all the horrible things to be dealt with by the heroes even if they could help instead. That had changed him, watching as other kids and adults suffered when heroes were supposed to help but they never came. How people would just walk by as they lay dying or in pain right in front of them. He hated it all and he wanted to change it all. So he was going to change it, but he wasn't going to do it by becoming one of those hypocritical heroes. He was going to change the society of the world by destroying it and then building it back up from the bottom. He knew that this kid could help him do it too. All those fake portfolios in his office spoke of cunning. The hidden compartments and mechanisms that held surprises spoke of viciousness. And then the look in his eyes spoke of the cruelty he could be capable of if only shown how. He wanted to show this kid how to be a villain, how to release all of that hate and disgust and cruelty onto the world. He couldn't wait to go and find out the answer this kid would give him. What'll you do if he decides not to join? Dab I questioned, always ready to play the devil's advocate. He's always willing to give a villain's information to a hero but not the other way around. How can you expect a person like that to just turn to villains? Shigaraki glanced at the fire user before turning back to the picture. Those eyes, how he could read those eyes over and over again. Easy, he said calmly. He turned to smirk at them gleefully. By releasing the beast he's had a hold on for so very long. Analysis. Hey Uri. Izuku called as he looked at the little girl drinking tea with Recovery Girl. I've come to pick you up. Izzy. Uri shouted out happily, getting up and running over to him. Are we going to go see Grandma and Auntie now? She questioned as he hefted her up into his arms and settled her against his hip. We can. He nodded before looking over to the older woman. Thanks for watching her while I dealt with that. I owe you one. The older woman chuckled and waved him off. No worries, my boy. You helped find me Kikayo, and you've helped save Toshinori. I dare say this school owes you more than you owe us. Izuku smiled before turning to look at Toshinori and Aizawa, Bakugo having taken off due to a call from his agency. Well, thanks for everything, but I think it's time to get going for us for the day. Of course, Toshinori said with his own smile. We'll see you tomorrow to begin your training. From there we'll work on getting you a hero license. Izuku chuckled while Aizawa rolled his eyes. It won't be that easy. The hero warned with a glare at the blonde. It takes hard work and dedication to become a pro hero, let alone a symbol of peace. I don't doubt it. He adjusted his hold on Uri quickly before tilting his head. We'll just have to make sure you don't get bored while teaching me then. With that he walked past the two and down the hall. Harry had been right, they needed to go and see his mother at the Bakugo's residence. That was where his mother had been staying since the fire and since they had no more money for any other apartment at the time. She had refused to move into his office building, stating that she had no intention of ever seeing Endeavor again. Unfortunately he couldn't guarantee that the flame hero wouldn't make an appearance there since the man had found out about his intelligence gathering on all those who held quirks. So Mitsuki had offered up the extra bedroom in their house that had once been a guest room. It had taken the combined efforts of the Bakugo mother and the information broker to get Inko to accept the offer, but they had eventually gotten her to do so. That had been a blessing as Mitsuki had helped his mother greatly. 
the once happy and peppy woman his mother had been disappeared after Endeavor had destroyed their apartment and left them to burn. Though not injured physically, mentally she had been scarred. She couldn't stand the sight of fire any longer and would cringe if a sudden burst of heat fanned across her skin. She hardly went outside because of this and it was difficult to get her into the kitchen to help make dinner. Mitsuki had quickly started exposing and to her own quirk, spark, where she could light up anything with a single spark. Candles, papers, and anything when her anger flared. The sudden heat would startle Inko and she would cower in a corner for long periods of time until either Mitsuki or Izuku calmed her down again. The exposure therapy had worked though and Inko soon was able to leave the house again and do the shopping for her friend in return for her staying at the house. She even helped cooking in the kitchen once more, though she still cowered away from those able to summon flames up on their bodies and would quickly run away from them. Her recovery only got better when she met Iri and the two got along smashingly. Izuku could only smile as he and Iri got off of the train and walked down the road to where the Bakugo household was. He should have visited her a week ago but Endeavor had been persistent and he didn't want to lead the man to his mother. The less scarring experiences were the better at this point. Izuku wasn't sure what had happened as he blinked up at the sky, watching smoke swirl above him and hiding the blue away. A little body was held tightly against his body as he tried to figure out what had just happened. He turned his head to the side, watching as the buildings there burned under bright and hot flames. He turned to the other side and stared at the flames leeching at the buildings on that side as well. The little body in his arms moved and he looked down to stare at the white blonde hair with the little yellow horn poking out of the forehead. The re. He was holding Eri in his arms as buildings on either side of him and that a flaming piece of something was flying straight at him. Shit. He grumbled as he rolled onto his stomach, protecting Eri with his body as the burning piece of metal slammed into his back where he lost his breath. He gasped heavily as he tried to keep conscious but the pain was too much and the weight against his back put pressure against his lungs. There was no chance of him fighting against unconsciousness at the moment. Analysis. God did it all hurt. He groaned as he came to and wished he hadn't because the pain was right up there with when he lost his eye. What the fuck dot 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 hit me. He grunted out as he peeled his eyes open. A fucking car. Oh, Bakugo was here. That was nice. Right at your dipshit face that was just begging to get fucking teabagged your shitty ass nerd self. Great. He groaned out as he sat up, ignoring the paramedic that tried to keep him down. Ari. All right. He nodded to the side. Izuku turned his head to stare at the little girl asleep underneath the bright orange blanket. Went into shock for a bit but is all right. Izuku sighed at that and nodded before remembering where they were. Mom, auntie and uncle. He questioned next with wide eyes. He had just been down the street from their house when whatever happened had happened. He prayed none of them had been hurt and that his mother was all right, especially with all the houses on fire. Fine, Bakugo replied. They got out and gathered with the other pieces of trash of the neighborhood. Minor injuries though but otherwise all right. Izuku was going to say something but stopped when a familiar voice sounded just outside the door. Hold that monster down. I don't need it escaping and causing more trouble. Don't even. Bakugo started but was easily ignored as Izuku stood up, ignoring how his sides were screaming at him to sit back down. Deku was growled but again he ignored it. He walked out of the ambulance, ignoring the arms trying to pull him back and smacking his blonde friend in the face to get him to back off. Once he was outside he took in the burnt buildings all around him and the officers struggling to hold down Anamu. It was one of the first ones to have been released, with black skin and a bright yellow beak. Its muscles bulged while its brain pulsed where it sat exposed. Next to that though stood Endeavor, still a bright blue coloring to his skin that clashed with his all-black costume and bright flaring flames. Izuku couldn't believe that it had only been that morning when Tashinori had come to him asking for help. It had felt like years had passed, but that didn't matter at the moment. What mattered was the group of civilians off to the side being attended to by paramedics. They weren't even paying attention to the EMTS though, only staring at the burnt houses that surrounded them. There was hardly anything left of their houses, but his eyes skipped over those ones, looking instead for the bright puffy blonde hair with the sleek green. It took a minute but he found both and could only stare as his mother cowered in Mitsuki's arms, trying to hide away from the commanding yelling of Endeavor. His mother was terrified and it hadn't even been because of the flames at the moment. No, it was because of the hero that had destroyed a neighborhood due to carelessness. Again Endeavor had cost people their homes and he had wondered how many died because the hero hadn't stopped to help save them. Anger roared through his body and he felt power crackle around him. He didn't notice how silent it became, how the Namu stopped moving and how the officers all turned to stare at him in amazement. He didn't notice how Bakugo stepped back so that he stood in front of the ambulance that held Uri. He didn't notice how those off to the side noticed him and the lightning jumping around his body. He did notice when that loud and deep voice turned towards him. Information broker, what business do you have here? He felt his eyebrow twitch, felt his body tremble with the force of will it took not to go after the jackass in front of him. Then he heard it, a whimper full of terror. He knew that whimper. That was his mother whimpering in terror because of this jackass that has done nothing but cause him problems since their first meeting. With him buried underneath a pile of burning wood and this piece of flaming trash sneering at him despite his plea of help. My business. He growled out as he stepped forward until he was standing directly in front of the pro hero, staring at him with narrowed red and green eyes filled with anger and hate. Dot 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 was to visit my mother in her home. 
he stated as he pointed at a building just off to the side that he knew was once the home for the Bakugo couple and his mother. The house that you have burned down. Again, he shouted, and never sneered down at the teen as he allowed his hands to hang at his sides. He wasn't stupid enough to leave himself defenseless against this boy, especially since he could cause some real damage if he wanted. I may have caused some damage here, but as I keep telling you, I've never met you before I came to you for information. He stated, I've never met you before then. Izuku growled as he allowed one for all to flow through his veins as he glared at this man. Maybe because the first time I met you was when I was buried underneath a pile of flaming wood trying to protect my mother from being burnt to a fucking crisp. Endeavor's eyes widened at that, his mind racing back to the time he had left a kid laying over a woman to die. He had at that time thought the teen had been paying a prostitute for sex and wanted to beg for his pathetic life. He was apparently wrong about that though. You left me and my mother to fucking die that day. Izuku glanced over to where his mother was being held by Mitsuki, the Bakugo mother staring at him with hard eyes, nodding at him. You left us there to fucking die in a building that you lit the hell up in the first place. His eyes whipped back to the hero. You were supposed to be a hero. But ever since that day, you're nothing more than a piece of shit villain in my eyes. The snarl that ripped through his throat stunned Endeavor and others flinch. And now you put my mother in danger again because you're careless and don't pay attention. Get the fuck out of here. He ended with a shout as he pulled his hand back and then launched it forward into the hero's stomach. He watched with great satisfaction as his punch sent the hero flying far off down the street and over the horizon where he disappeared. What ruined that satisfaction was when a pair of handcuffs were slapped on his wrists. You are under arrest for the attack on a pro hero. Chapter 6. Return of an Old Friend. Thanks so much for taking my mom in. Izuku sighed as he sat at the table of one Mitsuki Bekugo. It's no problem at all Izukun. Mitsuki waved away the thanks as she settled a cup of tea on the table. I just wish there was more that I could do for the two of you. She settled at the table with her own cup and sipped at it. He just nodded his head, his eyes always darting towards the door of the house. He knew that Yue had created dorms to try and protect the students since the appearance of the League of Villains, but it didn't make him any more paranoid about a certain blonde appearing. Just allowing my mom to live here gives us the chance to help pay off the debt from the hospital from both of our stays. He explained with a wary smile. Using those checks from your old man to pay that off, aren't you? Her sharp crimson eyes glared at the boy in front of her with worry. Yeah, we are. The job that mom had was able to pay off the rent and get food for us before the fire, but since she doesn't have to worry about those, the payments should go quicker. As long as you supplement your mother's treatments with a job. Silence for a long moment before Izuku nodded. Yeah, I, I found a way for me to get paid a large amount of money quickly and easily. He explained as he looked away, taking a gulp of his tea and ignoring the burn he felt. Please tell me it's a legal job. She grunted as she hid her eyes behind her hand in frustration. Sorry auntie, but I can't. He informed. But I'll be careful. Just take care of my mother for me. He stood up and grabbed his favorite yellow bag that had everything in there for him. He needed to get a move on if he wanted to get his plan rolling quickly. I'm heading out. I'll come and visit as soon as I can. Izuku, wait. The boy paused as a hand grabbed his wrist. Whatever you are planning to do dot 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 don't do it. Me and Masaru can help supplement, I'm sure of it. She looked at him desperately, knowing that this 15-year-old kid would go and do whatever he needed to do, even if it meant getting hurt, just so that his mother would live. Izuku smiles at her as he pulls his arms away from her, having to almost pry her off of him. I know how much you a cost Santi, even with the scholarship that Kakan got. Then there's the mortgage of the house and the bills and your own debts you and uncle have to pay off. He shook his head, taking in my mother and watching over her and helping her use the money that my father sends to pay off our own bills is good enough. He walks away once, not stopping as he leaves the house. Oh Izuku, Mitsuki sighs as she lets her head rest on her hands, exhaustion running through her body at the thought of that boy going out there and doing something possibly illegal just to help his mother. Analysis. Listen, I don't care, that's the flat rate for my information. Izuku growled at the villain standing across from him. Getting it isn't easy and the risk of arrest is high on my part, so pay up or go find information elsewhere. He thumbed the knife he kept in his pocket at all times. He had learned over the last half a year of what could happen if he didn't keep some sort of weapons on him to protect against those who wanted information. Mostly villains that wanted it and because all of his intel had been reported as accurate and useful, more and more clients had come to him. It was how he had managed to almost completely pay off all of the hospital bills that he and his mother had. But as more people came to him for that information, some more unsavory than others, the more danger he was in and the higher his price became. Not that everyone agreed with that thought process, but he wasn't about to allow villains to take advantage of him at the moment or even for a police officer to con him out of his business. He had too much to lose at the moment for either to happen. And I said I can just slice you up right here. The man said with a snarl on his face his spikes poked out of his head and along his knuckles. Those were the only places that were affected by the quirk though and Izuku had trained himself enough that he could knock the man out and run if he needed to. 
I don't have that much cash on me to pay for something as little as Mount Lady's number. Izuku rolled his eyes. He knew why this man wanted that number. Same reason why so many people coveted the numbers of their hits and their obsessions. To stalk and to claim them in a way that no one could. That was why addresses, numbers, social security, and any other private information were high-priced. Right up there with quirk weaknesses. Then go and talk to someone else. Though I can't guarantee that they'll have their actual numbers. He said as he began to walk away. Only to have to duck a moment later as that spiked knuckle flew over his head. His knife was in his hand only a second later and slamming into the man's stomach. The howl of pain caused him to flinch and that was rewarded with a fist to his face, slicing across that burned scars and dragging up blood. Luckily it missed his eye, otherwise he'd have to rip the DNA out of the man to get a new one. Again, he released his knife and tumbled backwards, hoping to get away without any more injuries. The foot to his stomach spoke differently as the man held the area where the knife was, apparently smarter than most and knowing how dangerous it was to remove the weapon in that specific area. You fucking little punk. I'll kill you for this. Izuku just smirked as he forced his body up, allowing the second kick to send him rolling onto his back. He was hoping to jump up from there but the other was faster than he thought and the stomp to his chest wrangled a cry from him. He could feel his ribs crack and begin to splinter as the foot continued to stomp down on top of him. He screwed his eyes shut as he waited to have his life beaten from him, leaving his mother behind all alone. Not even his father would be able to come and console her at his loss as the man was too far away and wouldn't have bothered anyways. Izuku was quirkless and useless to the man no matter what the teen did. He had given up on ever seeing his father again because of that. He coughed and screamed as one of the stomps hit hard enough to break a rib and he spat blood from having bit his cheek too hard. He expected the next one to hit hard enough to kill him and he slammed his eyes closed so he didn't have to see the vindictive and pleasure-filled face as his life ended. Seconds passed by though and when nothing happened for what had to be an hour, or so it seemed, he opened his eyes slowly. He blinked in surprise as a totally different face stared down at him, the body it belonged to crouched down next to him and his wrist resting on his bent knees. He wore a red plague mask that was lined in gold, standing out against his pale skin, black short hair, and almost black brown eyes. He wore a green jacket with black fur on the collar and a white button-up shirt and black dress pants. Izuku stared at him in confusion even as black gloved hands were held out to him. It looked like you needed some help. The man explained monotonously. Izuku looked at him for a long moment, analyzing the best he could with little to no information given to him. Thanks. He finally decided as he took that hand in his own and then his world exploded into pain. Analysis. He scowled at the policeman that sat across from him in the interrogation room. Really Naamasa, did you really have to drag me in like this? He questioned, irritation clear in his voice. Using a bullshit reason to bring me in too. That's low, even for you. Well, if you had just come in when I asked, then we wouldn't have had to resort to this. The detective explained with a shrug as a later file on the desk. We've recently gotten intel that you've received an invitation from the League of Villains. The man rolled his eyes before nodding. I'm guessing that Nezu called and told you then. The letter is at my office, if you ask Kakan, I'm sure he'll be more than happy to help you. He held his hands out in front of him to show off the handcuffs. I'm a little occupied, otherwise I would have gone and got it myself. The detective ignored it as he opened up his file and pulled out pictures of individuals and laid them on the table. Three familiar pictures of people, two of which Izuku regretted ever meeting. I thought you had them in jail. Izuku stated as he turned to look up at the other with narrowed eyes. Neomasa shook his head. We had these two but Rappa had escaped from custody before being booked. Chronostasis was able to escape recently and with him, overhaul. Izuku snarled at the detective, as if the man was personally responsible for the escapes. Get me a damned phone right fucking now. He snarled as he tugged at the handcuffs. He needed to call Kekin right now. He had to make sure that Eri would be safe with someone he could trust and make sure that she wasn't left out to be captured once more. It had been four years since she had seen Overhaul and if he had his choice, Izuku would make sure she never saw his face again. Get me that phone now. Naomasa shook his head at the man. I will once you've answered my questions. I need to know if you know of anywhere they would go. Where would they hide? Who would they contact? Will they go to the League of Villains for help? His eyes sharpened as he laid another file down on the table, this one with a sketch in it of a little girl with wide eyes and a little horn on her head. Though the horn was more in the middle than the side and the hair was too short and the eyes were almond shape instead of oval. It was Uri they were looking for again. Where is this girl that Overhaul had under his control and do you know if he'll go after her? Izuku really wanted to hit the other man in the face right now. He was stopping him from helping that little girl in his custody and putting her in danger the longer he was there. Look, all I've ever said to you about this case hasn't changed. You're just wasting both of our times and breaths at this point. He growled out as he quickly picked the handcuffs and released himself. So unless Endeavor has pressed charges or I'm arrested for a crime, I'll be leaving. He stated to the detective. Naomasa scowled as he watched the information broker leave the interrogation room, unable to hold him due to no charges and no crimes. 
It wasn't the first time that particular man had left custody and he knew it wouldn't be the last. Analysis. He had to hurry. That little girl he had at his side for the last five years is in danger and he can't leave her by herself for much longer. Luckily he regains all of his possessions quickly and dials in the number that he needs. Good thing he had the foresight to keep this number in his phone despite not having to use it often. Do you need a good fight? Was the first thing he hears and he can't help but smile at the predictable words. No, Overhaul has escaped with Chronostasis. I don't know who they'll go after first. Be on the lookout. He explained quickly as he runs out of the station and already sparking with lightning. Damn, was it great to have an actual quirk he could use to get around, especially as it allowed him to jump up to the roofs of the buildings and run across them. How long has he been out? No clue. I was just told about 10 minutes ago. I'm heading for Uri now to collect her and then hide her somewhere. He hasn't put his phone down and from the rustling sound on the other end, his friend is already getting things together to head out himself. Should I call Red Riot and Fat Gum? And there was the next predictable thing about this guy, his obsession with those two. Though, in this case, it would be useful. Call and inform them. Make sure they know not to move yet and to keep their eyes peeled. At this point, it's a waiting game. All right, I'll get moving them. With that a click and the phone went dead. Izuku could only sigh as he kept running. Hopefully Eri was still with Kaken. He knew that the blonde could protect the little girl with a ferocity that could at least keep Overhaul and Chronostasis at bay. As long as that man hadn't gotten his hands on any more bullets. If he did, then hell was going to break loose and so many people were about to lose their quirks whether they wanted to or not. He couldn't allow that to happen, not while he was alive and not while Eri was alive to suffer from the consequences of what was done to her. That little girl had been through enough and he was going to make sure that she wasn't about to be hurt. With all of that swirling in his mind, he quickly hit number two on his phone in his call. He always smirked at the thought of having Kakin as number two on his phone. His mother was number one of course. Where the fuck are you? Was the answer but Izuku could tell that the other was calm and relaxed. It also meant the other had put his hearing aids in. Are you at your house? He questioned back. He didn't need to waste time. Is Uri and our parents with you? Fuck yeah they are. Where the hell would I fucking leave them? Some shitty ass hotel. Fuck no. Izuku rolled his eyes at that as he changed the direction from UA. To Kakin's house, which was a mile from where Auntie's house had been. I gave your mother one of those sedatives you've kept handy. She was about to go into shock. Was softly explained, the voice rough but softer than normal. Izuku gulped and nodded his head. Thanks, I don't think she'll be able to handle the information I have to share with you guys. It'll be best to just keep it from her so she doesn't panic. She does that enough most days now. Look, that guy that Kirishima helped fight against four years ago, the one where he came from. He's out, isn't he? Kakin was always quick on the uptake. He never had to fully explain something for him to understand. All right, get the fuck over here as fast as your shitty nerd self can. With that he clicked the phone off. Izuku rolled his eyes as he jumped from a building, ignoring the screaming of a hero behind him that he had leapt over. It was the rabbit one that he thought was too much like Kakin to be comfortable. It would explain why he had ended up interning under her and now works alongside her company with his own. Mirko was a strong hero and he couldn't help but be relieved that she had ended up following him, though he was curious about why she was in this area in the first place. He ignored it for the moment though and led the rabbit hero on the wild goose chase as he made it to Kakin's. You shithead, get back here. Mirko shouted as she landed on the ground behind him and prepared to leap on him. Izuku didn't waste a second though as he slammed into the two-story house that was painted a dark green with orange trim. Hey, I brought a friend. Izuku shouted as he ran into the kitchen where Kakin was sitting with Mitsuki and Masaru. He could hear the TV in the living room and knew that Uri was in there was a cartoon. They didn't have cable at his place and so only watched movies or Netflix. Hey there punk. Kakin stared blankly at the rabbit for a moment before sighing and glaring at Izuku. You shitty nerd. He's a friend Yuzagi. He explained as he stood up and went to the cabinet where Izuku knew coffee cups were. Would you like to stay and listen to what's happening though? Fuck knows I'm going to need all the shitty help I can damn well get. The woman blinked in confusion before taking a seat at the kitchen table in agreement. Alright then punk, what's going on? She questioned as soon as she had a cup of coffee with five sugars and plenty of cream in it, just the way she liked it. I'll explain. Izuku spoke up as he looked at the people gathered at the table. Misaki and Masaru deserved to know even if they weren't heroes because they were taking care of his mother, his mother who might be a target now because of him. When I was 15, I started dealing with people, heroes and villains and fanatics and stalkers, for information. They'd pay me money and I'd give them information on an individual that they wanted. Ah, uh, analysis. Now I know where I recognize you from. Mirko chuckled at that. I remember having to stand off to the side and listen to Endeavor complain about you. Said you were withholding information from a hero in an investigation. Bunch of bullshit of course. She sent him a wink. Izuku smiled back before continuing. Well, because of that a certain man found me and took me into his group. A bunch of Yakuza people actually. There he taught me things and I helped him gather information in return for payment. I gave him a lot and I helped research and move along experiments as well. There was a frown on the woman's face now. It seemed she was starting to put the puzzle pieces together. She'd be the only other hero asides from Kakin, Red Riot, and Fat Gum that would know about this. He'd have to have Fat Gum talk to her too, so she knew what was really going on behind the scenes. 
But he wasn't very nice to begin with and I found out what was going on. What he was doing. His fists clenched around the mug of coffee as he thought about walking in just as Eerie died, her body blown apart and put together, and then resuscitated so that experiments could continue. I couldn't let it continue. Fat Gum and several others attacked a Yakuza base four years ago. Mirko said grimly, I wasn't part of the operation but I remember hearing about it. About a man who was making bullets that could wipe out quirks from within an individual. That's right. Kakan stepped in. Fuck face here was there for it. That infiltration that was put together by several agencies was used to obtain the base and rescue those trapped against their wills. They found the Yakuza boss there, completely disabled. He's still in the hospital on life support since no one can fix what was done. Mirko continued on. All the goons were gathered up, along with Overhaul himself. Though I can't see why people were so scared of him. She mumbled grumpily. He came out with a single bullet wound in the shoulder. Didn't fight, not even his right hand man did from what I've heard. Izuku and Kakan shared a glance before the greenette shook his head. Overhaul is dangerous in a capacity that most people wouldn't understand. He explained calmly. His danger lies in the fact that he's smart. He doesn't make a move unless he knows it'll benefit him in some way. He watches and he waits and he'll lure you in when he's ready. His eyes were shining with such a serious light that Mirko could only stare. Do not underestimate him because he doesn't have a quirk. That makes him all the more dangerous. There was silence for a long moment before Mitsuki cut in. What does that fucking shit have to do with Iri though? Dual-colored eyes snapped to her and she raised a brow. Katsuki was all worried about her when he couldn't find her right away. She'd gone to use the bathroom and he completely lost his shit until he could see her again. Izuku flicked his eyes at the blonde hero who was blushing at the moment. He wasn't going to rub in his face though because Izuku would have been the same way if he had been told that the person who had hurt a loved one was out and could go after them. It was a terrifying situation in general. But he wasn't going to hide it from these two, especially if they were going to be around Kakan and Iri more now that they had moved in with the pro. Overhaul is the one who had kept Iri prisoner and tortured and experimented on her. He stated bluntly. He used her quirk to create a bullet to decimate quirks from Iri's quirk by using her blood and so much more. He gritted his teeth and caught himself just as a crack appeared in his mug. I see, Mitsuki said as she looked over towards the living room where Iri was probably sprawled in front of the TV on her stomach. He knew that was her favorite position to take. She hated laying on her back on any surface, it brought up bad memories. So we need to make sure she's never alone and that there's always someone who can fight back with her. Masaru spoke next with a serious grimace on his face. What's the plan? Izuku smiled as all of the Bakugo family leaned forward with Mirko right behind. This could work. They could protect Iri and keep up with all the going on of the villains moving against them. He could rely on them to protect a little family he had created, even though it was created in a dark place. Analysis. Eraserhead. It has been a while. Fat Gum cried out with a smile as he walked into the teacher's office. The big man was still wearing his bright orange hoodie and black mask. He was at full mass so that meant he was ready to take a hit at any time. Aizawa raised a brow, along with the other teachers, as the man entered the room. What do we owe the pleasure of you gracing our school? The last time the man had been here was when Kirishima had graduated and he had invited him to join his agency as a fellow hero and apprentice. I wish it was under better circumstances, but I got informed just recently of an escape of a villain we helped put behind bars four years ago. Dark brown eyes turned to stone as they turned serious. Overhaul has escaped with his right-hand man. Fuck. Aizawa groans at that. You can't be serious. He runs a hand over his face in an exhaustion that had nothing to do with his lack of sleep the night before. Unfortunately I am. He sighs as he pulls out a bar of candy from his pocket. I've already called the rest of the attack team and informed them. They're all gonna start looking for him in chronostasis. My own has already started, along with all my contacts. Great. Just was I need. Aizawa stood from his chair and looked at the other teachers in the room. His ashy was staring at him with a frown that spoke of worry. I can rely on you guys to help out as well. But of course, his ashy is always the first to jump up and help him. He never doubted that that man would put his life down to help Aizawa and he would do the same. We'll all do what we can, Midnight said as well with a smile. She was always willing to help as well. And soon all the teachers were pitching in, letting him know they would call up favors and old students to work out. After all, they all knew the danger that Overhaul could create if he was left to his own devices. They had seen the bullets and the video records that had been kept on file during the man's experiments. They couldn't allow him to continue. Who informed you? He questioned as everything calmed down. If he knew who had found out first, then he could start questioning from there. Fat Gum stared at him for a long moment before shrugging, apparently he didn't see any harm in informing him. An old friend of mine in Red Riots. He had gotten a call from a friend of his own that told him. They're already on the move to counter what they can. Can you get us in contact with them? Nimiri asked as she settled onto his ashy's desk so as to better speak to the former policeman. Maybe they have more information that we can use. The former policeman shook his head at that though. Sorry, but I can't do that. He threw another large bag of candy into his mouth before continuing. Though I can tell you that you can trust me in knowing that the information he gives is correct. He'll get in contact with me if there's any more information that he thinks might be important. The other teachers frowned but nodded just as bad boys bad boy what are you gonna do when they come for you. Started playing. Fat Gum was quick to answer the phone. 
Really? A police ringtone. Nimiri rolled her eyes even as his as she began to laugh. Ah, I see. Then we'll met at my agency with the others. Have you started calling the rest of the task force? Fat Gum's face was serious even as Skittles started to be popped into his mouth quickly. Aizawa watched as the man's eyes narrowed before nodding and replying verbally in the positive before shaking his head and grunting in negative. He could imagine that he was speaking with either Red Riot or Sun Eater. Those two had been Fat Gum's favorite interns turned apprentices. He was happy that the man had taken them under his wings as they had gotten stronger and better the more they had followed him and worked with him. He had gotten to see Kirishima grow in leaps and bounds and become almost indestructible in his hardening quirk. He couldn't wait to see what happened next with the boy. He shifts his attention back onto Fat Gum as the hero gets off of his phone. There will be a few more additions to the group than I thought there would be. He informs them with a small smile. You remember the girl that was said to have been with Overhaul at the time of the raid? The one that disappeared? Aizawa questioned in confusion. What about her? She hadn't been found after the raid had been completed and she hadn't been found around the compound. They had thought that maybe she had ran away or hadn't existed at all as there had been no evidence to show that there had been a young girl there. Well, she'll be making an appearance at the meeting. He informed calmly, ignoring the wide eyes that were given, along with her guardian and a friend of his. Apparently that friend is also friends with Kirishima as well. He chuckles as he shakes his head. I've only ever met him once and the explosions just about took half of my fat away. He could feel his eyebrow tick. A friend of Red Riot's that could make explosions and that friend was friends with the guardian of the little girl that Overhaul had kept captured. He didn't care about the stares he got when he slammed his hands onto his desk as he stood up and glared down at it, as if it was the source of his ire. Of course, a fucking course that it had to be that pain in the ass that Yagi had to pick as a successor that had taken a little girl and fucking ran with her. There was no other fucking way that he could think of to make that description make sense. He was going to fucking have an aneurysm from the sheer frustration that Midoriya and Yagi were creating in him. That or a hole in his stomach from acid eating him from the inside out from the stress the two were already causing him. He didn't even try to stop himself from slamming his head on his desk as he collapsed back in his chair. This was going to be a long day dot 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 and o year dot 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 and o life. And it all started when Izuku Midoriya walked into his life. Analysis. Thank you for joining us on this incredible journey through what if Deku was an information broker. I hope you found it as intriguing and thought-provoking as we did. A big shout out to Black Wolf Hunting for crafting such a compelling story. Don't forget to check out their profile on fanfiction.net for more amazing works, the link is in the description below. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up, share it with your friends, and don't forget to subscribe to Quirky What If for more fascinating explorations into the world of fanfiction and fantasy. Your support helps us create more content like this, and we're always excited to hear your thoughts and suggestions in the comments section.